Hey, what's up, Scott Balkin here with the Imagination Creation Films, and today it is another glorious Friday. That's right, it is January the 13th, Friday the 13th, 2023, and, uh, you know, it's just another live stream, just one of those small little live streams where we have a great guest, a great guest that so many of you know, so many of you have uh, enjoyed his movies, his his commercials, his music videos, his short films, his instruction, his teaching, his seminars, his classes, everything about the guy. You already know him, but I want to bring in Shane Hurlbut, ASC. Hello, Shane. How are you? Hey, Scott. How are you doing? Pretty, so much. pretty darn good. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And of course, Friday the 13th, you and I hooking up. The it's, stuff's going to go south, and that's what I it's, love it's, about it's, this. Yeah, I feel it's just going to go flying <laughs> off the rails. And, but, I mean, that would be a Balkan live stream, I mean, just, just by itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, briefly, for, for the, the, the two people who may not know who you are, uh, who are you? So, my name's Shane Hurlbut. I'm an ASC cinematographer. Um, didn't start out as one. Uh, actually grew up on a farm in upstate New York. Uh, the uh, n No one in my family was a cinematographer or worked in the movie industry. Uh, my mom and dad were both educators. So I was surrounded by that educational bug, but uh, I really loved making movies and uh, had a little Super 8 camera as a kid and played around with that. and and uh, had aspirations to to go out to Hollywood. I uh, went to Emerson College in Boston. Uh, my wife and I literally packed up a U-Haul, a Ford Ranger pickup truck that my dad and mom gave me, and a scooter loaded into the back of the U-Haul with all <laughs> our tenting supplies and, and camping supplies. And we literally camped all the way across the United States to uh, come to Hollywood. And then I went from, you know, uh, I was in a position in, in Boston where I was the rental manager as well as going out on jobs as a grip truck driver and had kind of moved up the ladder beautifully within the infrastructure of Boston and realized that uh, the only way I was gonna be moving up in that position in Boston was if the guy above me died. So I was like, you know what, uh, I, I think I'm going to head to Hollywood to see where uh, if my dreams could come true. So there I am. We get to Hollywood and I get I go right back to the, down to the bottom, making three dollars and 50 cents an hour as uh, as an employee of a, a grip and electric rental company. And then, you know, quickly worked my way up uh, onto a movie. And uh, I was asked to drive a grip truck for the movie Phantasm Two this summer. The ball is back, uh, and uh, started to, you know, meet a lot of different filmmakers on that, and then that started uh, my my career. That's, so that's, that's in a nutshell. That's that's amazing, and and everyone out there, uh, feel free to ask all the questions you want. Any question doesn't matter. We're going to kind of group them as as we can. So if, if I see a bunch of questions that are all similar, we'll 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 pause our conversation and go and tackle those because Shane really wants to answer a bunch of questions from all of y'all. Wants you to wants you to feel like you're getting a personal one on one from Shane, which is kind of amazing. Uh, and then <laughs> we'll be diving through. You know, all, all different parts of, of his career and movies and, and technology and, I mean, just everywhere. So feel free, just throw those questions out there. Do, do we have anybody from Facebook out there? I don't see Facebook numbers coming in, but that's, I mean, that's fine. Don't, don't worry. It's, it'll be interesting. Oh, yeah, we do. Cool. All right, just saw somebody. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so right off the bat. Little Shane Hurlbert, little, little little guy. When 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 did you or did you did did you have a creative spark? Did did you feel something as a kid that made you want to pursue this? Okay, there's it's a two prong attack with the spark. Okay, the first spark 
was um, just growing up in the area that I grew up in. So near Ithaca, New York, Ithaca, New York was the original Hollywood. Back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the Hollywood was Ithaca, New York, if you could believe it. And through that, the whole area around Ithaca was where all the cool stuff was being engineered. Obviously, Kodak in Rochester, New York, was where the film was being made. Then there's a guy in Auburn, New York, that was a World War II Navy reconnaissance guy who used infrared light to be able to communicate from ship to ship. And he came back and turned that into sound recording film that that was a, well, that's when we were able to go from silent pictures to talkies. And it's, uh, the guy's name was Case. So I used to go to that museum all the time and, and learn about that whole thing and go to Rochester and the Kodak Museum. So I was kind of surrounded by that. But I think the first spark was me getting a Super 8 camera. My dad had one, he had those, I loved when I operated it, when it wasn't outside, I had these two, two Bell and Howell mushroom globes that would ignite on the top of it so you could actually get an exposure. And I'd kind of roam around the room and take, uh, you know, movies. And then outside, obviously, I didn't need that thing, but that was kind of my first spark of, of saying, okay, this, this could be something that uh, I, I would love. But I actually went into radio. So the whole thing was I became a DJ uh, for all the school dances. Uh, my uh, group of friends, we created an air band uh, and our air band was infamous. Uh, we were called the imposters. <laughs> and we went everywhere. Like, I'm not talking about like little venues where we're playing air bands. I'm doing, uh, we did a Girl Scout camp in the Catskills that had 4,700 screaming girls going crazy <laughs> over our air band. We didn't even know how to play a lick of music, but boy, did we put on a show. We had flash pots and shafting lights and all this theatrical stuff that we did we we did a whole tour where Lydia who's the CEO of Filmmakers Academy and my wife was Cindy Lauper uh, she would also be a go-go uh, you know so we had all these different all our girlfriends were in the band as well and we did a whole like two summer tours doing all the Boy Scout Girl Scouts little bar mitzvahs, uh, we did uh, full proms, uh, you know, so that was kind of a, uh, an area. And, you know, people said, well, Shane, you're really good at this and you got a really good voice. Why don't you go into radio? So I looked into a radio and television school and I knew my parents really couldn't afford a lot of money, you know, for schooling. So I'm like, let me make sure I wanna do this. And let's make sure that it's something that I love. So I literally went to a community college, Herkimer County Community College, and got a two-year degree in radio and television. And radio the first year was awesome. I was the program director, loving it, so much fun. And then the next year was television. And then that took me into a whole other area. And then, once that television bug was, was in me, I came back that summer from school after I graduated and my friend Gabe Torres was doing a short film for his USC uh, directing. He went to USC uh, and he was doing a, a, a movie in our hometown. And I asked him, hey, can I you know, help? And he's like, sure, you can be a grip and an electric. And that's where the love turned from television to film. And then once I was on that thing, I did, I was working days at my day job during the summer and then working all night on this movie because it took place all at night. I was getting like two or three hours of sleep um, when I was like 19, 
you know, getting, uh, trying to just suck up as much knowledge as possible and, and, and really saw this as a profession. So based on that, I was able to land this massive scholarship to go to Emerson College, go anywhere I wanted. And uh, I just remember my wife, uh, my girlfriend at the time, had taken off to Boston. And I remember coming in, sitting down in the guidance counselor um, chair and saying, Shane, you've gotten this big, huge scholarship. Where would you like to go? And I said, just get me into the best film school in Boston. I'm chasing after my future wife and that's where I need to be. And, and the script just writes itself. It just <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I chased right after her. And, uh, you know, after, so that was kind of the first kind of two to three layers of the spark. The final spark that launched me as a director of photography was on Phantasm Two, And I tell this story a lot and it never gets old. Uh, no, <laughs> I was, um, I was a grip truck driver on Phantasm Two, and I was hired at $350 a week. I logged 18 hour days on a six day week. So if you do the math on that, it's like it was just under 27 cents a, a, a day. Uh, I mean, an hour of what I right. was making. And um, with that, uh, I met a lot of great people. And one of the first people that I met was Brian Coyne. He was a USC grad who went in for cinematography and he was there as the best boy electric. And we became uh, really good friends. And I, I'm on the grip truck, you know, organizing and all of a sudden I hear Terry Wimmer, my key grip go, yo Shane, I need an 18 by 24, brought in stack. So I'm like, copy that, you know? So I'm running in the flag and I'm starting to go down the stairs to the crematorium set. And Brian stops me on the way up and he goes, Shane, would you be scared? And I go, Brian, what the heck are you talking about? I'm, I, I got to run this flag into Terry. Uh, he goes, would you be scared if you're in the theater? Look, every nook and cranny is lit. There's not absolutely any shadow. And it was like, pop. At, from that point on, everything was looking at light. And I went from a grip truck driver in 1988 to shooting Come As You Are, uh, Nirvana's uh, music video in 1991. So it was just a skyrocket uh, up, the, up the ladder based on just that single moment where I finally looked at light and looked at the emotion of how the people will be feeling in the, the theater. And that's when it all happened and the spark, you know, kind of catapulted my career. That was a long answer. Sorry. That, but that. that's that's a perfectly fine answer because it gets everybody <laughs> it gets everybody just a little taste. Just a little taste. <laughs> do, do you remember back back when you had your eight millimeter, your super eight, did, what kind of stuff did you do with that? What were you a lot of it was just capturing, um, you know, like I wanted to do a project where I just did everything in camera, so no editing. So I shot all the shots in order. So, right. you know, that was one thing that, you know, eventually when I went to Emerson, that was like the first thing they had me do. And I had kind of already done it. So it was kind of it was kind of cool that, uh, you know, that was all set up. Uh, but one of the things that was crazy is. And this is where, you know, uh, you know, you make so many mistakes and, and uh, failures in your life. Well, I had a massive failure on my beautiful vacation. So my parents, my dad was a, a professor's assistant at Cornell. And then we also had like a 350 acre farm that myself and, I, and, and my dad kind of ran. And I was on a tractor at 12 years old. So I was out there plowing, dragging, planting, you know, harvesting, whatever it was at a very young age. So I took this Super 8 camera out and we would take these 
epic vacations during the summer because that's when the tr the crops were growing and it was a time that my dad could really and my mom because she was a school teacher we were off in the summertime so we would do like epic eight week vacations that we would travel all by train throughout the whole united states i saw all 49 states in two years so we did we went across all of Canada into Alaska and then down through the top of the, the uh, United States. And then the second one was through the center and then down at the bottom. And so my first, uh, you know, I'm out there and I'm, you know, all of a sudden I see, you know, moose and, and elk and all this stuff and I'm rolling on my camera and I'm shooting it like crazy and I get back on the train and I'm like, oh my God, I only have one or two more rolls left. And my dad goes, well, you just take that and flip it over and you can uh, shoot on the other side. And I was like, really? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so I, I did that. And of course, that was complete failure, right? Because you can't record on two sides of, of an emulsion. But right. I did it anyway. Be cool. And what I got was a double exposure from hell, right? So it was like an elk, and then all of a sudden my mom's face would come over it, and she was like, looked like she was being attacked by this elk and all this. And I was like, my God, this is so cool! I, I gotta this. This inspired the hell out of me, you know. This double exposure stuff, right? <laughs> it was epic failure. So I got everyone, the, all the, the film came back and I invited all these people, you know, uh, from the neighborhood to see our trip across America and it was an epic failure. <laughs> <laughs> but entertaining nonetheless. Yes, exactly. I had, I had to bring down my, my fill light a little bit just so I could be a little contrasty too. Everybody's like, Shay's lighting looks so good. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> Uh, passion is addicting. Uh, yeah, that is that is true. Um, <laughs> let's 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 hit you with a couple of questions here. Um, if Shane had to pick one lens, one camera for passion projects for the rest of your life, which one would it be? Oh Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> wow. Pick one lens and one uh, camera for the rest of your life rest of my life oh god okay so one lens would probably be a 29 mil or a 27 mil right in that range uh, because you can go in for close-ups and it has a very immersive quality and you can do beautiful uh, epic wide shots uh, with them as well um, so uh, that uh, that's that would be my lens millimeter um, one camera, I would have to say, you know, uh, I have really been impressed with the Raptor series, uh, the V Raptor and the Raptor XL. I think that is a whole can of whoop ass on everything that we have been shooting with up until this point. Um, and again, what I love about the whole Red Eco uh, system is that. I came from film and when I was exposing film, I was kind of a mad scientist. I would do all sorts of stuff. Uh, they called me the, you know, the mixologist because I would take all these different film stocks and I would treat them in, a, in very different ways. I mean, we all know the pushing and the pulling, but what I would do is like, um, if you see filter, Hey man, nice shot uh, as a music video. What I did with that is I shot it on Super 16. I processed it uh, as the negative. Then I processed it as a positive, then created another inner negative, then a, another positive, then an inner negative on that, and then another positive. And then that's what we telecineed. So what you get from that is you get a saturation of the color that starts to bleed in to the emulsion and uh, it becomes super contrasty and um, 
it, it's a it's a very unique look. Uh, I would shoot on sound recording film. You know, everyone told me, Shane, you cannot shoot on this stock called 2378, okay? It's for audio. And I'm like, yeah, but you send it through the lab. And they're like, yeah. I go, well, I got to be able to expose an emulsion on that. So I did some tests, and sure enough, ADASA was the beautiful exposure for 2378. It only came in 2,050 foot rolls. So I had to take it to PhotoChem and have them hack them down into 400 foot uh, uh, you know, magazines. And it was the most stunning black and white I've ever lensed because the stock had 20 times the silver in it to be able to pick up the soundtrack. So I was able to expose on 20 times the silver that you have in a normal black and white stock. And it was stunningly beautiful. I've all, <laughs> I've tried to recreate this look over the years. And every time I show them, they're like, well, this is so beautiful. I've never seen the grays and tonalities that go, you know, so, and, and that also has an epic failure by me as well, uh, loaded into it because when you're a mixologist and do all these crazy things with film stocks, you're going to fail. Uh, <laughs> so I get the director all fired up about shooting on this 2378. We're going to do this massive Renova skincare commercial where we go out to the dunes, Dumont dunes out in Baker, California. And we're going to shoot all this blowing silks and, you know, faces embedded in sand and all this. So I show him the test in the 2378 and he goes, this is a game changer. This is unbelievable. I want that copy. So we go out to the desert and we're shooting and he goes, you know what? I saw what you did, but what if we put a red filter on it? You know, if we put that red filter, that's going to bring out the, the sky and everything that you would think black and white would react to, right? Black and white film stocks. You have red uh, filters to be able to bring out uh, the definition in the, the clouds. Then you uh, put a polarizer with that and it almost becomes three-dimensional with the, the quality. Then there's yellow filters that are really good for the skin. There's green filters. So there's all these different filters that work really good to create higher contrast or lower contrast black and white. So when he suggested that, I thought, what a great idea. Let's, let's add to it, right? <laughs> so we shoot with the red filter for everything. We send it to PhotoCap. And I call uh, Mark Van Horn immediately because I'm so excited about so you know because he saw the original test and he goes Shane you're on to something here this thing looks amazing and he goes all right I go Mark how's that footage look we were just shooting epic stuff and, and, and do my dunes you, you know, talk to me he goes talk to you about what I go the 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 imagery dude all we got back was black you, you actually shot on these things? I go, yeah, I shot a whole commercial campaign. Oh, we don't have any images. And then I go, what's the safe light on 2378? <laughs> Red light. Ooh. So everything we had shot saw red, and that was the safe light for the film stock. So it didn't see an exposure of anything because it was red. Wow. So, oh, my God, did I have to swallow my pride on that one. <laughs> I had to donate my time. I had to go to my camera team and a grip and electric and everyone. Can you please give this day for free? We had to go back the whole oh my god but at least it <laughs> happened in the three days of the spot so we were not like we had left Dumont Dunes we were still say, staying in some shithole motel in Baker <laughs> so we could react to it but yeah really uh, really <laughs> a, another failure but those are the that's, things that make you stronger that's awesome uh so the, uh, the the initial question that sparked all. So you, you're choosing a 27 or 29 lens, 
No, and, uh, uh, and the Raptor. Right. Now, are you shooting on Super 35, your Raptor, or are you going to shoot on uh, this division? Are you kidding me? I'm shooting on whatever I want to because that's the beauty of the Raptor. I can shoot <laughs> in 2K mode, crank the ISA, ISO up to 12,800, and now I'm shooting Super 8. I go to 3K, <laughs> dump it down to 6,400 ISO, and now I'm shooting Super 16. And I go to 4K or 5K, and now I'm shooting Super 35. I go to 8K on VistaVision. <laughs> it's a multi-format sensor. That's what's so awesome about it. And I did the same thing in the Gemini. I had this whole process of how I could create what the look of Super 8 exactly. I was going to 25 to 1 compression, cranking it up to 6400 ISO. Then, um, you know going in 2K, zooming in on the sensor at 2K, and all of a sudden you're having that digital noise and the baseball size grain, and you're off to the races. <laughs> Looks just like Super 8. That's awesome. Um, when did you finally realize you had made it into the film industry as a cinematographer? Um, I would say when I was nominated <laughs> on my first film, uh, for an ASC award. So I had been the youngest cinematographer. Uh, no one ever had been nominated for their first film. Uh, and that's when I think that was my coming out party. The Rat Pack uh, with Rob Cohen was the director. And um, that was all based on, um, you know, just an incredible script, an incredible vision by Rob. Uh, and that's what really got me noticed. And there's a, there's a kind of a, a great story around how that happened that I really would love to share with all of you because a lot of people think that, you know, you're, you're like grinding it out in the commercial and music videos and you're not getting that break. Don't ever think of it as that because lightning can strike and that's exactly what happened with my career so i was doing a music video with randy saint nicholas she was the uh director female director that i was doing she was one of my first female directors that i ever worked with and she was an absolute force in the movie in the music video industry in uh the uh, kind of late 80s, early 90s. And we did so, I mean, we must have done 70, 80 music videos together. And we were doing a Donna Summer, Bruce Roberts music video for the theme song for the film Daylight, which had Sylvester Stallone in it. And the Rob Cohen as a director is a very collaborative director. He likes to be involved in everything. So when they hired Randy St. Nick to uh, direct the Donna Summer stuff, he sent his producing team down to make sure that Donna and Bruce Roberts were taken care of, that they were uh, feeling really good. And what happened was those producers went back to Rob Cohen and they're like, we were just on the set of this music video, and I'm just telling you, whoever this DP is, I've never seen a man command a set like this guy. He has, he's so forward thinking, he's doing stuff that I've never even seen before. You gotta check him out. A week later, I got a call from Rob Cohen's office. I went in for an interview for a NBC pilot called uh, Paradise Lost. Um, and uh, I, we did the, the pilot, and off of that, him and I started a relationship. He came to me with the Rat Pack, and then once that narrative Rat Pack dropped, boom, I was off to the races. So never squander those music videos that you do uh, or commercials because you never know who's behind the whole infrastructure that's bringing you that artist uh, and why they, they're there. 
uh, because there's a lot of directors out there that are just like Rob Cohen, that love to have their hands in everything that is their movie to make sure it's one design vision. And that's what I loved about Rob. It's like he was able to unite the whole team in very simple ways so we were making Rob's movie and not 99 different movies. Um, and that's one of the, the, the greatest things that I learned, him, learned from him right off the bat. And I just wanted to kind of share this story because these are the kind of things is even though you're doing maybe these lower budget music videos and all that stuff, you're not sure who's going to view them as well as who's going to be back behind there that can open up your career and, and uh, shoot you to the stars. Very nice, very nice. I'll let you take a, a quick drink there. because. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. They, they love twenty nine, twenty seven. They they love that. Yep. Uh, what uh, on the the lens? Do you have a brand you would think uh, a, a specific twenty nine or twenty seven? You have to so live with I, it for the rest of your life. Oh Jesus! Gotta... Um, yeah, I, I I you know it's like a lot of people are all into anamorphics and everything, and it's so funny how these crazes go up and down through our industry. You know the anamorphics were huge in the 70s and 80s and then it went to spherical and now you're seeing anamorphics come back i mean if you gave me a 27 panavision primo i could live on that lens for the rest of my <laughs> life i mean that there's just something about uh the the uh primo glass uh, engineer in the 80s has a very unique flaring uh doesn't have so advanced coatings um you know, is is sharp but not too sharp. Uh, it's fast but not too fast. Um, you you know what you find is in, it's got the you know the two and then it's also got a like a one seven or a one nine blue marker that you go and then that changes focal, uh, you know, mill the distance and everything. That's where the lens starts to fall apart when you jam it down into there, and that's what really is exciting to me too. Um, so it's just leveraging the glass to be able to shoot all different types. Another one I would go for, so that, that would be my, my go-to uh, for a lot of the lensing. And then I'd go to like the old Zeiss uh, Mark II Ultra Speeds, uh, which I shot the greatest game on, semi-pro, something new, um, yeah, those those uh, films. I oh, we are Marshall. Um, I I really love those for the vintage look because their coating is not so good. Uh, they flare out very easy, um, and uh, they they have uh, very unique iris blades. Like the 150 has the iris blades in the front of the glass instead of the behind it, which is uh, very unique. And if you rotate the uh, the the um, front element it actually changes the um, iris so when you do a clamp on if the clamp on got all of a sudden askew it was actually changing your f-stop so there were a lot of pitfalls to that but i shot a lot of movies on them i had my own set i had done four sets i went through 78 sets in the panavision vault of the ultra speeds and i got four that were very decently matched and based on that uh people were really seeing how wonderful this glass was and panavision created p vintage which was they basically rehoused all those uh mark ii ultra ultra speeds the zeiss mark ii ultra speeds into the panavision housing so all the the ring diameters were the same size uh, they they kept the coating and all, but just made them much more functional for um, ACs. Because, uh, you know, doing four movies on those, my ACs wanted to stab me. Uh, because every time you change the lens, it was a different donut or a different ring. or And then the, the focus was marked on one side, but then it was marked on the other. So they would be on the dummy side, then they have to go to the smart side. So it was like a... And there were all these weird... Uh, millimeters too like the 29 I loved that millimeter it's the greatest steady cam lens ever it had the we called it the double nickel 
or the jacked up 50. So it was 55 millimeter, which was a great uh, kind of, uh, you know, millimeter to have. Um, 20, uh, 17, you know, a lot of uh, unique focal lengths that aren't necessarily in your, you know, 18, 21, 25, 35, you know, it had varying. Uh, and then I also had uh, Stanley Kubrick's, uh, one that he used from Barry Lyndon, the, uh, you know, the, the 1.0 that I would bring out every once in a while to really uh, create that super shallow depth of field. Very cool. Um, more topical from before. Could you elaborate on what is a safe light for film for the digital folks? Yeah. So when you're uh, sending um, your film into the development process, uh, it's going through different baths, right? And uh, each bath is, is um, uh, calibrated to a specific uh, temperature and a specific speed. So if I wanted to overexpose a stock, so if I wanted to push a stock, which means I rated the stock, it's rated at 500 ASA, okay? Not ISO, ASA, that was film stock. Uh, then I would push it to stop, so that would make it 1600 ASA. And then in the lab, I'd, you know, I'd write push to stops and they would uh, leave it in the bath longer. So it would uh, you know, cook a little longer. If I wanted to pull it and underexpose it, and underexpose it then they would make it go faster. Uh, so it's like these were kind of the, uh, the, kind of the, the lab process of, of you know, whether you're slowing it down to push or pull uh, or speeding it up. And then what I would do is in this lab environment, they would have obviously the safe light being red, red light. You've ever gone into a, a, a photo uh, dark room, they would always have a red light there for black, for black and white photography or, or uh, whatever you're doing. And that was safe for you to develop uh, in your, uh, your pan. Well, Film stock has the same thing, the safe light. So the, the technicians can go around and make sure everything is going through the, the, the sprockets and everything perfectly. This is what a safe light would be. So they'd have a red light on. The, the film would not see that as a red light. It, would, it was safe. So the, the safe was that red light and they could look at everything and make sure the process was was going smoothly. Well, this is the same thing. So me, by shooting with that red filter, that photo, you know, chemical process didn't see as anything being exposed. So it didn't develop anything because that was its quote unquote safe light in the lab. Hopefully, hopefully uh, that, that yeah, clears I think, that up. I think that answered it for him. Uh, let's see here. There was another question here. Uh, where'd it go? Try not to, to jump too far ahead. I'm trying try to stay, stay topical, but also get these questions answered. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, a lot of things are said on YouTube about filmmaking. Uh, what is your advice for a new filmmaker that you would give? Okay. I get asked this a ton. Uh, and what I think made me a, a, a good filmmaker was that I started at the bottom and worked my way up. And everyone says, well, I'm not gonna start at the bottom. I'm a director of photography. I'm a cinematographer. I, I learned enough in school and, uh, and I'm going to uh, start doing what I do. Well. That's all great, you know, have at it. Uh, but I don't see you coming out of school and being a necessary cinematographer. Uh, it's, it's something that you really need to get the practical knowledge that a film school cannot necessarily give you. They can't give you leadership skills of managing 200 and 
five people like I had on Terminator Salvation that was lighting, grip, and camera. Uh, it cannot give you the scope of doing massive blue screens and green screens and digital replacement and VFX work. It cannot give you the one-on-one -on -one training of understanding how to shape light, how to move the camera. You know, you can talk about it in theory, but it's one thing to th talk about it in theory and use the little dollies and whatever you get in film school, but getting out in the, the field is, is where I think you really learn your craft. So I started out as a grip truck driver. I wanted to start out as a grip in my uh, ascension to becoming a cinematographer. Why a grip? Well, because a grip learns how to shape light, which is in control contrast, which is huge for cinematography. And you, and then my next thing that I did was a dolly grip. Well, what does a dolly grip do? Well, the dolly grip moves the camera, moves the crane. This is where you're tapping into the emotion of the story. When that push in is right, how you move with the characters. So I started to understand camera emotion. Then I became a key grip. So I could really work one-on-one -on -one with, the, with the cinematographer and the, um, the gaffer. Now this is where you start to get your style right because you're working with all different cinematographers i worked with daniel pearl i did so many music videos and commercials with that man i worked with joseph yako with herb ritz we traveled all around the world doing levi's loose jeans and calvin klein and vogue and all these huge uh campaigns absolute vodka i worked with kevin kerslake who was a very experimental filmmaker in the music video uh, era. Uh, so um, everything was him was, that's how I became my mixology because he was like, let's fail and let's see what happens. And I was like, what, we can just fail? And he's like, yeah. He goes, oh, by the way, we just, uh, we just uh, developed the whole Smashing Pumpkins music video in your, uh, in your bathtub uh, for Cherub Rock. You definitely have to check that out because we, we did the whole uh, developing process in my bathtub and I would, um, the way we set that up is we shot the music video, we rolled film, uh, Super 8 film for 10 seconds, then we started the song. So I would start to roll the, the thing for 10 seconds and then I knew that's when the song started and then I would go at the pace of, you know, 24 frames per second and everything was awesome and I was being developing everything cool and then when it got to the guitar solo I slowed down so I overexposed the image and then sped up to underexpose it through the piano and the keyboards so I was organically creating the the edit and the look of the movie based on just developing the image right so it's like these are the kind of things that train me and by working with other cinematographers you start to understand their style and you start to pull from their inspirations and style and then you make a mixtape and that becomes Shane Hurlbut and that's where I think that a lot of cinematographers first coming out of school get yourself in a trade get yourself in as your key grip as a gaffer work your way up through that side or work your way up to the camera side i mean so i was a grip truck driver a dolly grip then a key grip then a best boy electric so i understood how to distribute power then i became a gaffer then a first ac second ac then a director of photography so by doing all those things, you start to understand how to do a lot of people's jobs. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing <laughs> because I tend to <laughs> micromanage the shit out of people sometimes <laughs> because I know when they're blowing smoke up my ass and that they just don't want to do it, right? Uh, so that makes me very defined. I know what my vision is. I know how to do it because I have done it. So what that does as a cinematographer, when you're in prep, you're able to do a lot of decision making for the key grip, for the gaffer, for the camera department, 
in prep to set them up for success because you know how to do all these jobs now. So you know and you can start to push the budget where we're gonna need rock and roll trusts and we're gonna need to put the lights on movers and you know, and I know exactly how to rig that and I know the right device and I need fly swatters and you know, which fly swatter I need. Is it a condor, is it a pettibone? All this, I'm able to take that knowledge that I acquired and put it into being a better, actually doing the work as a cinematographer. So if I had to say anything, start at the bottom, learn the individual trades, and don't think of it as like, oh my God, that's gonna take me forever. Well, let me see, I started in 1988 and became a cinematographer in 91, three years, okay? Now, that, if I could quantitate what a normal human being would be able to uh, do during that time, it was probably more like eight years. Because I did 120 music videos in one year. So if you think about the scope of what I learned in just one year, it was like four years. It's like what Bogey, this one gaffer, he goes, yeah, Shane, I'm 45, but I've been awake enough to be 80. <laughs> I mean, we just went from music video to music video. There was times when I never got, I was shooting a Herbert's um, Vanity Fair commercial with Cindy Crawford out on the, the beaches of Malibu and being done at five o'clock, running to LAX, hopping on a flight on Southwest, puddle jumping to San Francisco, driving to Mount Tamalpais, and shooting Smashing Pumpkins, Cherub Rock, till seven in the morning, hopping back on that plane for a 9 a.m. call time <laughs> at the, uh, in the Malibu Beach. And I did that for four days straight with maybe an hour or two of sleep on the plane. So, you know, it's like, this is, you know, being in the film industry, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult career. Uh, but I have to say, it's one of the greatest careers you could ever imagine. I mean, I absolutely love what I do. And that's why I love talking with all of you because I'm one passionate guy. And I just love uh, to share my knowledge and, and uh, you know, listen to all of you and your success stories, stories moving forward. And, and, and yeah, the film industry is, is one of the few industries where you get back what you put in. So you, you give your creativity and you get creativity back and, and it just constantly feeds it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. All, all this talk on film, I'll share with you my, my, my lifelong ambition to, to do before I die is I want to do a live stream on film. So it's going to have to go through the whole developing process and scanning to lie, to, to, it'll be it'll be a delay, but I think it can be <laughs> a done. slight delay, maybe two days. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's, yeah. I think it can be done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see here. Let's get to the next question here. Um, has your approach in lighting faces changed over the years? Lately, I've felt that using a uh, beauty clamshell setup gives the more honest representation of a person. Do you ever go through phases? Yeah, there's, uh, that's a great question, Aaron. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I think I go through phases um, of, of how I light. Um, and, and the phases are really generated by the script. Um, you know, like take fathers and daughters, for example. So I did that with Gabriel Muccino, Russell Crowe, Aaron Paul, Amanda Seyfried, uh, Octavia Spencer, Jane Fonda. Amazing cast. Um, and I love those father and daughter, you know, father and son films. I always just love those because I think about the moments of my mom and my dad and our relationships and all that stuff. So this was a really special film for me. And Gabriel Muccino said, Shane, this has to be honest. Uh, uh, the, I, I want this film to, to have an honesty and a rawness to it. And I said, okay. And he goes, and I, I just want it to feel like everything is just lit practically. That it's just this wonderful 
practically lit spaces that they just move through. So you feel with the characters and you feel the honesty of what they are going through. And I was like, okay, cool, I love that. And the whole movie was, was lit practically. Um, and it's kind of like, that film is like a masterclass in practical lighting. Where to position the practicals, uh, how to work the blocking around the room in the practicals, um, you know, the simplicity of just one light in a, uh, in a, um, a bathroom, a fluorescent fixture over a, uh, over a mirror that when Russell Crowe goes in there and just completely breaks down and uh, has a seizure and is laying on the floor underneath the sink and how that light quality looked underneath there. Let's, again, keeping a very simple, just the one uh, light source. Um, and yeah, so that was, that's, uh, that was, you know, what the film and what the director kind of told me to do. Uh, there's times where you'll get another movie like uh, The Greatest Game Ever Played and uh, talking with the late Bill Paxton. I, I miss this man every single day uh, that he was taken from us so early on in his life and his career. Uh, but he was, you know, he was very much like, Shane, this is before the invention of electricity, so I want it to feel real. I don't want us to, you know, make this thing look like it's uh, just, ambiently lit from wherever. I want to see the source. I want to see the gas lamp. I want to see the, the uh, you know, the, the candle. And then when it goes to electricity, I want to feel that incandescent bulb, you know? So I had to, you know, not base everything on practic practical because, you know, as we know, back when I was shooting this, it was still film. And, you know, a candle or a torch uh, or a, uh, you know, a hurricane oil lamp couldn't really give a lot of exposure. So you were constantly trying to say, okay, how can I augment this? How can I bring up the, uh, or how can I create some fill so we can say she's lit by the, the oil lamp, but then there's enough fill so it's not so contrasty. So, you know, you start to, you know, come up with, with a style that's going to emulate those lights, then transition to emulating what it's going to feel like with electricity. But I, I have to say right now, I'm kind of in the imperfect stage. Uh, I don't want the light to be so perfect. Uh, and I want it to be as honest and real as we can think. Like right now, you know, I have a beautiful key light on it and I got a really nice uh, contrast and fall off. But not everyone has to be lit like that in an environment. It looks good, but that's not the reality of scenarios. If I turn the fluorescent lights on here, it would change the whole dynamic of this room. So, you know, it's like the imperfect nature, but still taking that imperfect and still making it cinematic. Don't making it like you're shooting a documentary, but just when you go to light a face, don't make it so perfect. Kind of screw it up a little bit. And I think that has a realism to it and a reality base that it just brings the audience in to saying, yes, I, I, I see this on a daily basis. That's, I, I'm, I'm bonding with this scenario. That's awesome. Uh, let's see here. Uh, do you have a favorite positive and negative film stock and why? What, what, what's appealing to you? So positive and negative. So film stock, I love 5298. Uh, that was my go-to for all tungsten. Uh, and then uh, 5201, uh, which is a stock that I don't think is available anymore. I think uh, on uh, when I did Terminator Salvation, we rolled 2 million feet of film of 5201. So it's a 50 ASA stock. Uh, which is what I wanted that film to feel like. Uh, I wanted it to look really unique, and that stock had a, had a really strong contrast, uh, you know, in, in day exteriors. Uh, there was also a, a great film stock that um, 
was the 320 ISO. I think it was 5277. So when film was finally kind of starting to transition and, and they started to see that the telecine process was uh, becoming very much alive in music videos and commercials. So you would shoot the film, then you would get that and that would go into a uh, telecine where you'd put the film into a, you know, you develop that film and then you'd shoot it through uh, basically a scan, it's not a scanner, but it was uh, literally you're pushing it out onto an, uh, an image that becomes on your TV screen. And that's how we had all the color. You know, I was able to control music videos beautifully and commercials all in the telecine process where, commer where feature films didn't see this till 2004. I was doing it in 1990, 1989. I was doing this whole telecine process where I had windows and full control and, and secondaries and everything. So when I came to film, I, I'll never forget doing the Rat Pack. I was like, okay, so what am I doing in a theater? And they're like, well, Shane, what we do is we, we show the movie and then you're going to comment on each shot. I'm like, and, and here's your color timer. Oh, hey, hi, Mike Zuccarini, uh, Zuccaria. Uh, nice to meet you. Okay, and roll the film. And I'm like, oh, uh, that shot needs to be a little more magenta. Uh, 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 that one's a little too cyan. Uh, uh, that's a, needs a little too flat. And I'm, uh, and I'm going through this process and I'm like, are we ever gonna stop the movie? Are we ever gonna talk about just this section? No, we just keep on rolling, keep on rolling <laughs> till the movie's done. And I was like, Okay, great. That was a really good color timing session. I was like, what? You know, and then, you know, I'd come back again and look at the next pass and I'd be doing the same thing. Oh, that one was a little, to take a point of magenta, take two points of yellow out of that, you know, and it's like six or seven times you would get a movie that was fairly consistent based on the color timer, adding his little points of yellow, magenta, cyan, okay? So, that, uh, you know, that whole process, um, you know, I, I kind of, I'm trying to get back to this question. I, I went off the rail. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, basically with that film stock, a positive stock that I really loved was shooting all the ectochrome. I used to shoot ectochrome a lot and also cross process it. I did several music videos where I did ectochrome and, and uh, processed it in a negative bath which then jacked up everything. Uh, I would also do uh, processes like uh, skip bleach, ACE and CCE processing that was done at uh, Deluxe. Then you had another lab that was doing what they call just skip bleach. And then there was another lab uh, that did, I think Photochem did skip bleach and then Technicolor did bleach bypass. They all had different, uh, you know, terms that they they would use. Where instead of taking the silver out of the negative, they would leave uh, a amount of silver in it, which made it more contrasty, made highlights bloom, um, you know, quicker. Uh, so I would say, kind of the Ectochrome 35 stocks that were all around the 400 IS, uh, ASA setting. And then for the negative stock, the 5201, I think they call it 5206 now, which is the Daylight Balance 50 ASA, and then 5298 for the uh, tungsten-based stock. Very cool. Let's see here. Uh, a lot of projects you've worked on require a ton of time commitment in, uh, in blocks of time. How have you been able to balance work and life through the ebbs and flow of production, especially knowing you have a family? Ah, great question, Preston. This is right up my wife's alley. And I was going to say, <laughs> where's Lydia? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Lydia, come on in so we can talk wellness. Um, no. um, yeah, so that was very difficult starting out. Um, you know, starting out in this business and really making your mark, uh, you know, when you know you've kind of hit it and people are acknowledging that you're talented and, 
and uh, investing in you as a cinematographer because that's truly what the studios do. When they hire you, they're investing in you. They're investing in your skills. They're investing in your artistry. They're investing in your creativity. And they're investing in you to be a really good leader. And when I was coming out of the bat, I shot up that, that ladder so quickly that I have to say a lot of my leadership skills were not very well perfected. A lot of my personal interactions were not so perfected. So, you know, I had kind of, and my um, relationships with my family was sacrificed. Uh, much of when I was, when Kira was born right after the Rat Pack, I took a year off and really hung with her. And then my career just took off like a shotgun blast. And then poor Miles uh, got the shit end of the stick on that because I was in the middle of drumline prepping. I came back for seven days to have for him to be born and trying to bond with him and then back off to the prep process and and then it was just one movie right after another so that balance life family career balance was shit uh and you know i i took some time to really you know look at myself where i was as a leader uh how I was connecting with my family and I just changed the damn channel. And what I did is I started to put um, etiquette and protocols in base uh, in, in my daily rituals that started to bring the family together and feel like even though I was 3,000 or 6,000 or 12,000 miles away, they felt like I was there. Now, the first thing you have to do in this balance is when you are home from your project, you are home. You are not still trying to get your next gig. You're not still trying to you know, grab a commercial or a music video there. You are home. And that was the, the one thing that I did right off the bat. So that was, that's, that's the, the biggest uh, takeaway for when I was not navigating it very well was at least I was doing that right. So when I came home, I was invested. I was with my kids. I wasn't distracted. I wasn't trying to get the other gig. I wasn't trying to go and, you know, put myself in front of directors and producers and wine and dine and that whole networking process. I, when I was home, I was locked in. When I, when I wanted to change things, I basically set up the etiquette and rituals with my wife. So even though I was 3,000 miles away, I would get up and we would do the same thing every morning. So I would get up, I would first go to my phone to make sure the call time hadn't changed or there wasn't a question from the AD or something that was very pressing before I actually went to call time. Then I took my glasses off, put my phone down, set a meditation, and would meditate for anywhere from five to 15 minutes. And then I would take that meditation that I did and I would text it to my wife. Then I would stretch. I would stretch out, make sure that I was all limber, and then I would enjoy my coffee, and then I would go into my phone and answer any emails that had come in uh, or questions from my crew, and then I would go off to work. And then Lydia would do the same exact thing. She would meditate, she would send me her meditation, and we would be constantly, now we're in connection. Even though we're on two different time zones, we're living and breathing within the same space, even though we're not in the same space. That's and the same thing was with my kids. They were all on the same chat. So we were sharing our meditations. I would share little fun pictures from the set. 
I if I was cooking something after, uh, uh, you know, we'd wrap, I would share them a video of my, you know, thing that I cooked. Everything that was the connecting the family together, because when I'm home, I cooked most of our meals. Uh, when I'm there, uh, we're laughing and watching movies. So I would say, hey, I just saw this movie in the movie theater. So it was trying to bond with the family by doing everything that we would usually do on a daily basis. Now you're basically doing it on a daily basis, but from a distance. And once I started doing that, it was a complete change. Like the, the family felt much more connected. They knew that they could, uh, you know, reach out to me on set. And there's going to be some times that I'm like, Lydia, it's tragic hour right now. I got to call you back. Uh, or, <laughs> my God, I, we're about ready to wrap. I just got to get this last shot. You know, before I would say, can't talk, honey. Doosh. You know, but now I would start to round that off a little bit. It wouldn't be the sheer cliff of I can't talk now. I'm like, Lydia, it's tragic hour. I, I'll call you right back once we're done, you know, and starting to keep that dialogue. So that's what I found is the recipe to, to balancing the family thing. Also knowing that, yes, you have to push yourself, but, you know, doing more than two movies a year is very daunting. Uh, I've tried to limit myself to just one movie a year so I can spend much more quality family time. We're also taking much more family vacations together, hanging out with each other, uh, going to little special events, whether it's concerts or, or uh, you know, the symphony or what, going to museums. These are the kind of things that are, are very essential for keeping that family bond. And you also have to have a soulmate that understands the industry because this industry will suck the life out of you. And it's been built around destroying families. So, oh, wow, wow. I want to go into the industry that's all about <laughs> destroying your family. Woohoo! Sign me up. You know, what the hell? But I think with the Me Too movement and COVID and everything that's happening with our industry, we're starting to see the wheels start to turn. So we're not doing those massive 14 and 16 hour days. We are starting to, um, you know, starting to care about the individual. And if the family, if, if I have a, uh, a failing, you know, mom or dad that's, you know, at a point in their career where they're ending, you know, coming towards the, the end of their life. I want to be able to be there for them. I want to be able to connect. I don't want to say, okay, if I have to hop off this movie right now uh, and go take care of my mom, I actually have a, you know, a director of photography seat to still come back to. This is, the industry is starting to spin in that direction, but you can see the weight of that on a cinematographer. I'll never forget the day we are Marshall. I went to work and got a call from my mom that my dad was in the hospital and they were giving him, you know, three days to live. And I literally had to drop everything. I turned to Mick G at the time and I said, my dad is dying, I need to go home. And he said, go for it. So I did it over a weekend and like two or three days. So I was able to go there. We got him the care he needed. He bounced back, which was awesome. And I was able to come back and I had a job still waiting for me. So they gave me basically five days off. So my gaffer and my, uh, my A camera operator kind of took the reins for me. And, and shot those days, which I cannot thank them enough. But then, right after I got back, my wife almost died. So Lydia got spinal meningitis. And I turned to Mick G and he said, you cannot do it again. So these are the difficult times in the, the industry where I had already called in that favor that I didn't think was absolutely gonna be uh, you know, a possibility. And then when my wife, my soulmate, 
is is sick and has got spinal meningitis, I had to literally call my best friend up from Vermont, Danny Wade, and I said, Danny, I need you to be me. I need you to fly in from Vermont and I need you to help take care of my wife. And he did. And he came in and there was huge support from all of my family and cousins and everyone to try and help Lydia get back to health. But these are scary times and this is the kind of stuff that's gonna happen. And you know, hindsight being 2020, I should have just walked away and been there for my soulmate. Uh, but you know, it's like, uh, I, it's like, you know, you're in that ascension in your career and it's like, right. what's the right decision? Um, I, yeah. I love the, the, the way you designed communication back into your, your family unit. That, that was, that's brilliant. That's, that's, that's honestly what uh, clearly what, what so many people needed to hear is to, to understand when you're apart, how do you communicate the same way that you used to? Because you need that communication to keep your family going. That, that's, the, that's brilliant. Your, your, your significant other has to be invested in your career as well, right? They can't uh, see this as, as taking all the time away, all this. This is the kind of structure that needs to happen to build your career. That's why Lydia and I didn't have kids for 10 years. She goes, let's take this 10 years to build your career, to get it set on a, uh, you know, on a trajectory, and then we can have kids, right? And I was like, wow, that's, that's so smart. You know, let's do that. And we traveled the world together. We, we really invested in each other and really took that 10 years to say, okay, this is us. Uh, and then, we had our kids and we had Kira and Miles, which I absolutely love to death. And, you know, they become rock stars in their own uh, sense as well. Um, you know, and, and uh, I love to see where their careers are going and what they're interested in. And, and um, you know, Kira uh, went to school to be an actress. So anytime that I can lend a hand and nudge a director, hey, uh, I think Kira would be perfect for this part. Uh, you know, I'm always dropping those little seeds for her, but you know, these are the kind of things you do as a very proud dad uh, mm -hmm. to really, um, you know, you're trying to help your kids in any way, shape and form. My parents, you know, were lower middle class. They didn't have a lot of money, but uh, they just told me, dream big, follow that dream, do whatever you want, uh, and we'll support you. And that was the greatest parenting that ever happened to me because I knew that if I failed, it wasn't a failure. I was trying, I was pushing myself out of my comfort zone to be able to get to the next level. And you know, with that, you need a soulmate like your wife uh, or girlfriend or significant other to be able to understand this business and how difficult it is and find that wonderful balance. And I'm telling you, it's a lot of compromising. Okay. Uh, Lydia and I said, we counted the other day of how many family vacations we have canceled over our, my 30 plus years of being in the business. And it's like 37 or 38. Full on two, three, four week vacations literally stamped out. Um, so you can see that it's an ebb and flow and your family has to get understand the ebb and flow of that. And once they do and understand how hard you're working, how you're just delivering that passion and artistry every day, they have to be in full support because they're seeing that you're in full support even though you're 12,000 miles away. Well, that's the, that's the true definition of a soulmate is someone who evens out the, 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 the ebbs and flows. I mean, yes. you, you may be fantastic at cooking and your, your soulmate may be horrible at it, but your soulmate may be fantastic at taxes and you may be the worst, but you know, you, you even out and extending that out in the film career. I mean, you get somebody that is on board with 
you and as a couple that yeah that's that's awesome you described our relationship perfectly lydia is it's, great it's, with numbers and taxes <laughs> It's the same relationship I have with my wife. <laughs> she does our taxes and does our numbers, and she wishes I wouldn't spend any. <laughs> exactly. The, the you don't, you don't mind Lydia? if I just you don't mind oh, if I yeah. destroy this prop, do you? <laughs> no, not at all. Light that baby up. Uh, yeah, Lydia's the the first one to constantly say, "Shane, you need to resize this." Okay, <laughs> you're thinking a little too big here, and I'm like, "Okay, yeah, you got it." Back in the day when I was like, you know, on my, you know, my ascension to get to where I am, I was like, no, we're doing it. This is what we're doing. Now it's like, you know what? You're right. This is a little overblown. Let's scale back on this. You know, as, as age happens, you kind of soften a little. It, it's, it's true. It's true. Because it's, I, yeah. I, for the longest time I was like, well, scale it back. Uh, no, no, it's it's a binary switch. It just it's either on or off. We either get to do it or we don't. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it's called wisdom. Right. It's, yeah, it's called losing arguments so many times that you start to realize maybe my side is not the right side all the time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, let's see here. Where? Well, there's there's a ton of questions in here. Was um, what? Uh, what are your thoughts on a red Komodo? Have you used it or uh, have you used it in any projects or? Yeah, I've used the red Komodo uh, a good amount on at least three movies. Um, I, I love its size, you know, um, its size is, is spectacular. Uh, is the image a little compressed for me and uh, you know, a little baked in? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, that's why, you know, the Raptor is like a, you know, uh, the size is bigger, but it's giving you a lot more uh, data and a lot more yeah. depth and dimension and a lot more latitude that, you know, the Komodo can't. What I love is for Jared to, to take that Komodo and actually, you know, beef up the, uh, the quality of that thing because he's got, he's got a very powerful tool in that small package and, uh, you know, unlocking... Um, you know, a little more depth and dimension and latitude in that baby would be spectacular. I mean, just from a drone standpoint, I use these guys called Beverly Hills Aerial. And they have been following me since the Shane's Inner Circle days. And, you know, when I was taking all the small cameras in the DSLR world and kind of turning them into movie making machines and putting it on a 60 foot screen and everyone's like, that looks like film. Yeah, it's a Canon 5D. Uh, you know, they've been following me. So they embraced the Komodo immediately and they started putting it on that gimbal that Scott has right there. So I brought them out uh, on a Toyota spot that I did last winter and they blew my mind because they put a uh, anamorphic zoom on it. It was like 11 to 16 anamorphic zoom. And so we were able to shoot anamorphic. He was flying at 170 knots, okay? And for drone work prior to this invention, Drones were dead to me, okay? If a drone cannot fly as fast as a helicopter, why am I not <laughs> yeah, right. using a helicopter? Right. Because, you know, going up like this and doing these daunting kind of just top downs that move, it's all good. But when it comes to action, that camera's got to attack. It's yeah, got to uh, push. It's got to pull. It's got to attack from above and scrape down a building and shoot through trees. This is the language of cinema. Well, you know, drones are like, <laughs> you know, they, they couldn't do anything, you know, and these heavy lifter drones, you know, 30, 40 knots. That's a car driving 25 miles an hour. Right. So when I did Need for Speed, the drone technology was just starting to come out. I did it all helicopter. I was flying at 140, 150 knots with that helicopter, attacking the cars, chasing them, doing all that stuff. And then when Beverly, Hill, Beverly Hills Aerial was showing me a lot of the stuff that they were doing, I'm like, what does this thing max out at? 
And he goes, we're up to helicopter speeds and above. And I'm like, all right, now we're talking. And, <laughs> you know, they made that Toyota spot so incredible. You, If you go to Shane Hurlbut, uh, ASC.com, uh, it's on my website. Uh, and you can see all of the uh, Beverly Hills aerial incredible work in that spot, uh, as well as check out their demo reel. Their they're uh, incredible artists, and they just embed you uh, in the commercial and in the movie. So um, I, I have a whole other uh, huge expedition that I'm going on in uh, the summer, and uh, I'm going to be bringing them along with me to, to document all of that. So, that's nice. um, But that's, that's kind of where the Komodo really started to change the drone game as well as DJI creating a very small, lightweight gimbal that can fly. Because you couldn't be flying the Ronin or the Movi, you know, Pro. That was a heavy lifter drone, and what you got was 30 or 40 knots. But with, uh, with the DJI RS2 and RS3, I got uh, And This is the Mini. This is the $350 one they just dropped two days ago. And, I mean, oh, I it it's, flies Komodo all day long. Yeah. So it's, it's just like we're lightening the load. We're, we're creating lenses that can go on this to create anamorphic in a lightweight sense so we can still get that cinematic quality. Uh, not everything is in focus. You, you get to feel the imagery have much more punch, um, which is exciting. Indeed. <laughs> That was, that was pretty topical there. Uh, let's see here. So Shane Hurlbut, ASC.com for, for those of you looking there. Um, okay, let's see. Let's go down. Well, we got tons and tons of questions here. Let's see. Um, uh, do, do, do. Wow. Well, okay. Um, you doing, you doing okay on time? You got... Any? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. My um, son okay. called me two times during this podcast. It's oh. just classic. <laughs> as long as he doesn't doesn't text you nine one one, then you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I get all the phone calls during mine. <laughs> uh, and yeah, if you have to take a break, take take a break. Don't. No, I'm uh, just gonna say, uh, how can I help you? <laughs> There's lots of people loving your advice here. Just just singing your praises here. Um, KJ asks if we've ever worked together, and if it will happen in the future. We've never worked together, but I would, I'd, I'd work for you any any position you have, anytime. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's see. That's uh, Butlin's character. Oh, uh, Carlos thinks you should have. You, you were going to say cook for the, your favorite lens. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like I said, you know, it's like all uh, lenses are, you know, I, I, those are the, the lens is the soul of your movie. Now, back when, you know, we first started had the digital, you had the red one, and then you had, you know, the, the, uh, let me get my camera centered. Okay, yeah, you had the red one, there we go. and then you had like, I'll give you some airy, more whip. <laughs> yeah, then you had the airy, right? And there was this grand divide. Right, and then over the years, these formats and how good they look have become to this. So creating your, uh, picking your digital emulsion uh, that I pitched way back when the digital era really just started to take hold, that has kind of gone by the wayside because I think the camera's latitude, their, their quality, their ISO ratings, their clarity, their digital noise floor, all that stuff is becoming so close now that now the lens is truly the soul of the movie. P picking your film stock and then the lens was very big uh, when I was in the film genre. But now the digital emulsion, so whether I shoot with RED, Sony, Airy, that really doesn't matter. It's now the lens. And with the lens, with the Cooks, you know, Cook S4s, I loved on film. And they did very well on me with digital too. I shot Fathers and Daughters of Digital with them. 
I shot Need for Speed. But one thing that I noticed in the digital world is uh, those lenses, the Cook lenses didn't have as many of the uh, leaves required. So when you only have seven leaves, uh, you know, on your iris, you're gonna get that star pattern that happens uh, when you stop down or, uh, but not even stop down much. I shoot most of my movies at a two or a two eight and they were still starring out on me. Any out of focus bokeh was a stop sign or a saw blade, right? So, and that kind of took me out of, of the element when I started seeing those uh, weird out of focus bokehs uh, and also the star patterns from lights. Uh, I would use it to my advantage, uh, specifically on fathers and daughters. At the end of the movie, Jane Fonda is up and she's giving the Pulitzer Prize uh, to Russell Crowe, who's, who was dead, but he was giving it to his daughter. Um, and I wanted that to be felt like super special. So I specifically let the Cook lens star out on all of the uh, the, um, e the ETC Lecos that were you know coming back from behind Jane Fonda and the stage and the upper deck. So when we pushed into her, you had these beautiful star shafts coming out, you know, light shafts, uh, not using smoke at all, just letting the digital sensor do that. Um, so I tried to use the the inadequacies of the lens uh, as a as a pro uh, to to actually uh, take my project higher, uh, but now you know going to cooks we're going to definitely have to go to the newer cooks and the full frame cooks where they've you know engineered a lot more blades uh, you know in the the blades in the iris so you get beautiful bokeh whether you're shooting wide open or uh, an f-16 so um but yeah i love cook glass i love what it does uh to the skin tones uh, i also love how it flares it does a very unique flare that gives you it almost gives you like rays that come out that have a uh, kind of a halo uh within it very very unique flares uh and my my watch is actually uh asking me uh, sir he wanted to know about the flares at the same time so, uh, <laughs> she's had some opinions for you <laughs> yeah yeah maybe she's got a question for me That's right um do you still enjoy filming music videos <laughs> she's like yes i do actually <laughs> uh yes i i love music videos um and I was honored and lucky enough to work on a very unique film that's coming out this year. And the film is called Musica. And it is going to be on Amazon Prime. Um, it was like doing nine music videos within a movie. So it so basically like when you were young again. <laughs> exactly. It brought me back to my roots. And one of the unique things that we did on this movie. So, okay. Uh, for those that don't understand how a music video works, you basically record a soundtrack. You record, you know, the song that is out in all the radio stations and, and in your Apple Music Library or Spotify. Then that person comes to the set and you play it over speakers and they lip sync to the song. That's how music videos are made. And then what I did on many music videos, if you want to slow down that process and make it look like they are singing at real time, but they're, they're, they're moving in slow-mo, then you do a 48 frame pass. So you take the song and you speed it up to 48 frames. So they talk like this, and they're singing, and it's like wrapped around my finger, wrapped around my finger, right? So they're singing really fast. So then it comes out where they're in sync with the song, but they're moving in slow motion. So this movie is about a, a man who has a disorder called synesthesia. 
And synesthesia is where when you hear sounds, you associate a color. So you see a color with those sounds or you take each sound that you're hearing. Like say if the person went into a diner, okay? And he was hearing the clanking of the uh, plates being set down. He's hearing the, the hamburgers on the grill. He's hearing the people come in the door. He's hearing the cash register close. He's hearing the, the uh, chef's bell ding. And he takes these sounds and he composes them then to an orchestra. Now, what we did unique to this was everything we shot was a live sound event. So we weren't lip syncing. They weren't faking drumming. They weren't faking hitting stuff. We had a sound team come in two days prior to the location. They would rig over 70 mics, one for the cash register, one for the bell, one for the drums, one for the slam of the refrigerator, one for the clank of the plate, one, you know, they were all hidden within the space. It was like hidden camera. This was hidden mics, right? And then we would shoot it and they would perform it live every single time. So <laughs> this was like taking the music video experience and turning it up to 11. And it was so much fun because the artists were playing their heart out. They weren't kind of, you know, lip syncing it or mimicking them doing it. And it was so awe inspiring to watch these artists kind of bring this to life. And the last time I had this feeling was when I shot the movie Drumline. And I had, if, if you could, a sign in 2003, right? No, 2002, I got the call from Tim Bourne, the producer on Drumline. And he said, hey, did you get the script? Uh, we really want to move forward with this. We want to see what you think about it. And I was in Kansas City and I was directing a children's hospital commercial. And I go, Tim, I got your script, but you know, I don't think I'm the right guy for this saints go marching in bullshit. I, you know, people banging on drums and playing trumpets and sousaphones. I, I don't think I, he goes, where are you? And I'm like, Jesus, um, I'm in the Hyatt in Kansas city. What's your address? You know, I'm like, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, my, I gave him my address and he goes, talk to me tomorrow. So I'm like, okay, good night. I'm like, shit, that's, what the hell's going on here? So I go <laughs> and I shoot my commercial and that commercial was very intense. When you're directing a commercial, you have the agency, you have the client, you're trying to balance all those things. And I was director cameraman. So I'm also on the camera. So I'm with the agency and with the client and that everything is cool. Okay, cool. Oh, we want to change that up a little bit. Then I got to hop on the camera and make that. And I got to light the damn thing, right? So I get done with that day and I come back and I'm exhausted. And I walk into my hotel room and there is this AV setup. So this is back in the day where they would roll that cart in, Scott. You know, the cart with the cathode ray <laughs> the tube <big> television. <laughs> the big About TV. About to fall over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And below it, it had the little VHS VCR. deck. Right? <laughs> and I walk up to it, and there's a sticky note like this on the a device. And it says, play me. <laughs> I was like, okay, th what the hell's going on? I pop in it, I hit play, and I see this drum team. This drum, drum board, line yeah. just going crazy. They were called the Senate. And they were just going, and I, it was like, it blew my mind, and I was running for the phone. And I, <laughs> up and I go, hey, Tim, how you doing? He goes, oh, you watched the video. So how's that Saints Go Marching In bullshit going for you? And I go, this is unbelievable. I, I'm, I'm in. 
So, you know, I was like, I had the same thing with this movie. I read the script and the script was funny, but I'm like, how is this all going to work? And the producer goes, let me send you a sizzle. This is proof of concept that the director did. And sure enough, I watched that two and a half minute piece and I was running for the phone once again. I go, I don't, I'm in. That, you know, I know the budget's tight. I know this will make it work. I have to be a part of this project. So, you know, that's the other thing in your career. It's like you want to be able to ebb and flow peaks and valleys of what you do, like Terminator Salvation, $200 million movie, to this movie, you know, $17 million, $20 million. Uh, I did 1114 for $1.5 million. You want to, as a cinematographer, you want to be able to not just do those lower budget projects when you come up the ladder. You want to ebb back into those when you've been established because that's what keeps you sharp and it keeps you uh, frosty and it keeps you in a way that you're just not the big budget guy that, you know, this is, you got to have your 90 person crew and, you know, all your cameras and this, that, and the other thing. You want to be back to using popsicle sticks and gaffers tape uh, to create a shadow coming through a wall. Or you, you know what I'm saying? It's like you got to It keeps you from be, being stale. It keeps you. And keep, it keeps you humble. And this is where I find a lot of cinematographers go off the rails because they get in their head and who they are and they got their PR teams all around them and all that stuff. This is something that I always said to myself, no matter where I am in my career, I'm going to be humble. No matter what question you ask me, I'm going to be very honest and I'm gonna share my knowledge and give of my time because I'm in an industry that has given me so much that I want to be able to give that back to all of you and donate my time to, to kind of shape the filmmakers of tomorrow. And keeping that quality of going up and down in your budget, uh, I see Maddie Libatique is another person that does that brilliantly. He's constantly going up and down on his movies and budget. Uh, and it it makes him a great cinematographer. Um, and, this, and I this find a, that... Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, I was no, going to say, I this would, is a great... great go, yeah, go. <laughs> no, all I, you. I'm not talking. <laughs> uh, it's a great uh, segue uh, to talk about your, your Filmmakers Academy, I think. It's, it's, you, you talk about you're constantly giving back, and... There's there's tons of ways that you give back. This is absolutely fantastic, great way of doing it. But there are uh, other ways on your your filmmakers academy where people can learn at their own time. They don't have to come at an exact time to do it. And if you want to like take a few minutes and kind of talk about what you're doing there, so people can hear about this resource because it's it's pretty wild. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a, a wonderful learning curve, just like my artist cinematography. You know, I've I've learned and failed and succeeded and, you know, everything along the way. My wife came to me in 2010 when I was kind of, you know, really uh, being a part of the um, the DSLR revolution. And, you know, I had this crazy idea and everyone poo-pooed it. Uh, everyone told me it was impossible. Uh, everyone told me I cannot shoot on a still camera. That's no way to make a movie. Um, and I just said, you know what? Thank you so much. You've only uh, confirmed that I have to make a movie with this device so I can really show all the camera manufacturers that you have to start thinking small and stop thinking big. So the filmmaker can feel like they can move the camera in ways that we've never been able to move it. Um, so that was kind of that genesis of that idea. So with that, Lydia and I are sitting in bed and she goes, you know what? We need to start talking about this. We need to start educating uh, filmmakers uh, about this trailblazing stuff you're doing with the DSLR. We need to excite 
a revolution and an insight or excite or whatever the word is. So, um, and I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I'm going to brand you. Uh, I go, I'm not a brand. I'm a cinematographer. And she goes, no, this is going to be amazing. We are going to share this knowledge. So we created the Hurl blog. That was the first thing we did. And we started, you know, as much knowledge as I shared with everyone all over the world, I was getting intel back from people in Switzerland and Normandy uh, and, um, uh, and you know, Norway and Canada and all these different filmmakers all over the world. They were sharing their knowledge with me and it was helping me make Active Valor. It was helping me change the whole protocols and etiquette of how I was shoot, shooting the movie. It was like, because that movie took two and a half years to make, it was the whole evolution of the DSLR movement. By the beginning, we were just shooting with Canon, uh, you know, primes on a Canon 5D Mark II. By the middle, we had transitioned to Panavision Primo uh, primes and zooms. By the end, and, and mixing that with film. So it was like 25% uh, you know, uh, film, 75% DSLR. By the end of it, we were still using the Primo lenses on the DSLR, but we had almost gone 90% DSLR at that point. So during that two and a half years, I had used all the intel that, that the members had shared with me, as well as me trailblazing it with my elite team of camera assistants and operators and everything. We were able to design a platform for the DSLR. And out of that, we shared this knowledge. And then everyone said they want more. They want more knowledge. So then we're like, okay, let's start this little hybrid of a of a um of a blog and we'll call it a membership site we're going to call it shane's inner circle so it's not the bloggers now you're in my inner circle and i'm gonna you know put a very stupid price tag on it which was so low we could barely finance everything that we did and we ended up donating all of our time and energy and money and resources out of our own personal bank account to launch this. And based on Shane's inner circle, they were getting these very deep blog posts. We called them power posts. And then people started to really want more video. So then we started going into the video world and then we became and we created the Hurlbut Academy. And the Hurlbut Academy was this huge uh, website that had maps where you could find people all over the world. You could hook up with them. You could see their reels. You could see any kit they had. You could look at their uh, CV. You know, it was so blown out to proportion. It's like, this is the killer website for every cinematographer. And of course, it was a, uh, you know, coded website. It was not, uh, you know, so anything that happened with it meant we had to redo code. And that was a goddamn disaster. So then we finally moved to the Filmmakers Academy. And we realized that to really um, practice what you preach. Remember I said, start at the bottom, be a grip truck driver. A uh, dolly grip, a key grip, a gaffer, a AC. We are now expanding the Filmmakers Academy to take in every nuance, every department head within making movies, commercials, and music videos. So right now we have cinematography, we have uh, producing, we have editing, we have color grading, uh, we have uh, assistant camera person, we have gimbal, we have key grip and gaffer uh, in, in the platform. We're expanding to production design, uh, costume design, hair and makeup. This is the broad scope of how we're going to scale the Filmmakers Academy. But any other thing than that, you really need to have my wife on, Scott, 
uh, because she is the the grand vision of this uh, academy. Uh, she puts her heart and soul into it. She is such an amazing leader, and she has assembled this incredible team that uh, we are just, we're firing on 12 cylinders now. And the content that we're putting out and how much content we're creating on a weekly basis is pretty uh, exceptional. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one mentor calls. So like I'm answering you in this uh, podcast with Scott, I do one-on-one -on -one hour phone calls with people. Uh, I've had a lot of calls where they're starting their first feature and they want me to take them through the whole process. I've had people that are shooting their, their commercial or their music video and they want advice. I have people that want advice just on a, from a uh, family the kind of the, the golden nuggets that I dropped on you, how we unite our families together is, is stuff that Lydia is uh, also a wellness instructor. So in the summer, we're launching a huge course from Lydia that's all about wellness for filmmaking. So it really takes, uh, I've been her guinea pig for the last you know, we've been married 35 years. I was going to say about 30 now. years. <laughs> So, you know, I've been her guinea pig for 35 years of all her concoctions and lotions and potions and everything that she's got me jacked up on. And I was working with Rudy Mancuso, who is the director of Musica, and he goes, whatever the hell you're taking, I want to be taking that shit. Because I've never seen a 58-year-old run around the set, jump up on ladders, adjust light, back to the camera, push the dolly in on the shot, go back to the monitor, you know, keep the team all wondering and saying, you know what, my word for today, how are you doing, Shane? I'm fucking fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the Filmmakers Academy is in one whole full sweep. It is a very fantastic resource for filmmakers all over the world that you can really dive in and go down the rabbit hole. It's everything that no one ever talks about, we do. And we kind of open up the pull back the curtain so you can really see the creative process that so many keep very close to their chest. And if they keep it close to their chest and they do talk about it, it is in a director's chair talking about what they did on set. I am not in a director's chair. You are watching over my shoulder go through and make every nuance every scrim, every flag, every adjustment on the camera, every lighting adjustment, you're seeing it live. And it's like you're, you're there. And this was something that David Weldon, our creative director, came up with. He's like, you know what? I want, making this is all like a live sporting event. We're gonna shoot this with seven cameras. There's gonna be one at the monitor. So when you come over there, you can be intimate with them. You can talk about the subtle nuances. When you blast off, now you're followed with a Ronin. And that Ronin's gonna take us through the whole set and go to wherever you're adjusting that flag. Why is he raising that flag a little bit? Oh shit, we're going back to the monitor again. And we go back to the monitor and see, oh, that cut that was you know, hitting her in the eye. Now it's lowered across her her mouth and that's you know much more attractive than what that shadow is doing or maybe her chest is a little hot my eyes are going to this area and i want my eyes going here so i go in and set a little flag like a net to take that down so your eye is directed to her face this is in the art of cinematography the art of color grading Dave Cole, who is an absolute rock star. You gotta understand how the Filmmakers Academy has been, how we manicure and manifest the people that are on the platform. These are all people that I have worked with throughout my whole career that I am now sharing their excellence with all of you. So think about that the loyalty of 30 some odd plus years in the industry that have seen film go to digital, the digital space, the volumes, the LED walls, that integration. This is the ebb and flow of the art form. So they have the base of film 
to still be able to talk about and understand what that photochemical process was and then how we can incorporate that and push it into our digital uh, space and get that same kind of baked in feeling that we used to do when we were cinematographers and kind of creating that photo, uh, photochemical world that you really couldn't change much. Uh, you know, you, you had limitations and those limitations were kind of cool. But now that the limitations have been really opened up so there aren't many, we have a free reign to do whatever. I feel that it's just opened up, you know, many more uh, creativity streams that are coming out of my mind to try and shape that. So this is what our, our team is. Uh, this is what our mentors are. And, and the other thing that's really cool that we started at the end of last year is what it's called spotlight coaching. So yes, you can get a one-on-one -on -one with me for a set amount, but within the whole Filmmaking Academy members, which we have you know over 12,000 members, they can ask their questions to me, to Derek, to Dave Cole, and then Dave Cole goes in and he selects four out of the cluster of how many questions he gets. And he spotlights those uh, members for 15 minutes and answers their questions. And we do this every month. Uh, this month is Derek Edwards. He has been my camera assistant for 20 plus years. This guy has been in the trenches with me. We've climbed mountains together. We've been in uh, swampy conditions and active valor getting, uh, you know, live fire flying over our heads as uh, the Navy SEALs are taking down, a, you know, a, uh, a, an operative. Uh, you know, th this is a person that's really been in those trenches with me and he's sharing an hour and a half of his time to answer any camera, ACs, life, balance, all these questions. And he takes those four questions we, the first people that sign up, the first 30, are invited into the Zoom stream so their questions can be answered after the four spotlight questions. But it's been so rewarding. I go on every one because I love to oversee. And, and uh, if somebody, like the other day, I was on with Dave Cole, and he's like, is Shane on here? And I go, yeah, I'm here. He goes, this is a good question for Shane to answer. So then I answered my side of the cinematography question. And then Dave Cole went into taking that. And then he answered his color grading part of it. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, environment. And net, what we're also adding is a whole member networking. So we're going to start having a cocktail hour. Uh, and that way we can come in, we can break off into break up, break out, uh, breakout rooms, and we can start to just network and start to build that very small community base, uh, which everyone kind of loved when I first started Chains Inner Circle. Now we're bringing that to this, this massively vivid and immersive, op, you know, back end of what we have within the Filmmakers Academy. And now you're able to see that uh, live and breathe. So. That, that, and that's that's amazing. I, I am going to reach out to, to Lydia and, and see if we could get a, a live stream with her just just so she could go through this. Because it's, it's a huge resource. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, eight, it's over 800 hours. And when I say it's, that, I'm like, 800 hours? Oh, my God. And if you go in, we also have career paths. So you're like, I want to be a cinematographer, right? Well, you can take the beginner cinematography class. It is like a four-year degree from USC. It's 220 plus hours. And you know how I start you? I start you with no video content. When you click on that beginner cinematography, if you could go in there and find beginner cinematography career path, are you able to do that? Uh, yeah, I'm looking uh, at beginner cinematography here. Um, I probably just type it in. Let me find it here. Beginner. Uh, cinematography star starter kit? A career path. Career path, okay. Yeah. Uh, workshops. Do, do, do. Career path, okay. Uh, there's career path. Cinematar, do, do, beginners, corporate. 
Career path. Beginner cinematography career path. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So um, I so you can see all the career paths are highlighted in green, so you can find them. So click on that one, and you are going to see this. Now scroll that playlist to the right. These are 25 to 45 minute long <laughs> presentations. Keep scrolling, baby. <laughs> 204 videos there. 204 wow. videos. So scroll back to the top. What's the first lesson? Uh, beginner cinematography, educational resource books. <laughs> okay. The next one. What's the next Resiliency. one? Resiliency. Resiliency. So all I do is for the first 10 or 12, I'm just hitting you with audio, okay? So I'm talking to you so it's not the shiny video on the hill. It's not, oh, squirrel, squirrel. Ooh, that's a shiny object over there. I wanna know if you're invested. I wanna know that this, you gotta understand that this career requires resilience. And everything that you don't really learn in film school you don't learn to be a good leader. You don't understand what the film industry is, that it's going to suck the life out of you and spit you out if you're, you don't have a good plan, um, if you don't have a good nest egg, if you don't have a good brick and mortar foundation for you as a human being, your mental state, your, your monetary state. This is an investment and the rewards are massive down the road but you have to invest in yourself and that starts with education. And I am never stop learning. I, I read, I'm, I try to uh, learn as much about every camera system that comes out. I'm constantly educating myself on lighting units and camera and different lenses and all this stuff, as well as learning how to cook a cauliflower with a balsamic vinaigrette dribble. <laughs> You know, it's like Which, I, I <laughs> we'll have to come back on that one. You're in my, you're in my territory now. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like I love, you know, what I do so much. And, you know, Lydia has found a way to harness that passion and put it into a funnel that kind of, you know, hopefully sends it down to all of you that you can kind of soak it up and, and sponge all that knowledge into your mind and really kind of, and you know, again, I'm one cinematographer, but we're adding more cinematographers. We just added Justin Jones, who shoots a lot of commercials and music videos. He actually is shooting a feature right now. So we're starting to give like an entry level cinematographer so you can learn about how he shaped his career and how he started out. So maybe the way you're starting out is not necessarily the way that I started out in the industry. So now you're gonna start getting both sides of the, the story. Um, we are having uh, other cinematography mentors starting to be added to our, our roster as well as other production designers and producers and colorists and all these things to try and expand so it's not one voice, it's a multiple of voices, just like I did when I came up the ladder, how I took a little from Daniel Pearl, a little from Joseph Yako, a little for Kevin Kurzlake, and that became who I am as a cinematographer. Now you can start to sample from me, sample from Justin, sample from the other people that we're bringing in to kind of create your mixtape and your style that's that's yeah that's amazing uh do you need to take a break or anything you but you've been no i'm good i can go out. okay i can go forever oh, oh yeah we're i know we're, we're going forever going... i'm not gonna do the charles pappard shit okay? oh come I'm on go i, I haven't gotten hours. to charles i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> all right let's <laughs> let's do some rapid fire questions here because they, they've been building up and i'm Okay, good. I am being laxed here. Let me see. Uh, there, where was it? Where was it? Let me start up here. Find it. Uh, okay. Um, we'll see if we can we we can go through these fast. Uh, if you're working with a small budget with no art department and need to shoot a scene with a bare white room, what advice would you give to light that room to make it more interesting? Ooh, I like this. Yeah, that's good. 
white rooms. Um, I, my whole office is white rooms. Um, this is white walls everywhere you see. Uh, so, you know, how do I use that? Well, the, you can turn white walls into a beautiful blue wall right back there with the right uh, placement of some tubes. I have tubes that I'm literally hanging from the drop ceiling in here, and that's giving that blue dimension in the background. Um, you can, oh yeah, so uh, Weldon is coming in so he can operate so people can ah, see what we hi, got. Hi, Weldon. <laughs> <laughs> so this is good, because this is a perfect environment to understand, you know, lighting white rooms. Uh, so Weldon is going to adjust our, our uh, tripod here so he can actually tilt. I got the thing pinned up against a bookshelf. <laughs> Okay. All right. So I'm now going, Weldon's I'm going blue up. too. Okay. So Ooh, right there that. you can see those blue tubes that I've just dangled along. And that uh, is obviously up out of frame. But when you tilt down, you have this beautiful tonality that now your white walls have become something very unique. Now here, if you tilt up to this light here, that's a top light source. And it's a four by four top light source. That's, oh, that's something nice. that's very good for lighting white rooms. So you create the top light source. And if you're doing an interview, you would have uh, the person, you know, uh, off to one side of the top light source. So they're not in the center of it, but they're off to the side. So they get the whole length of the soft source. So that wraps into their eye, but it, Sorry, wrong side. This side, <laughs> I'm looking at a monitor, so I'm like, right? this side would go darker because they're set on the edge of the soft light. So that's all by positioning the person so you can create a top light source that looks very close to what you're seeing illuminate me right now. Now, the reason this is not flying all over those walls is tilt up, David and you, he's gonna tilt way up, I have this massive teaser that goes all the way across and is taking the big uh, soft source that I have here. I have two uh, two by four um, light mats and two two by two light mats. That's what's illuminating me over here. Uh, so that top source is keeping it so it's not flying onto the white walls so you're able to get that nice blue co color tone in the background, but it's not flying everywhere. So the secret to lighting in a white room is contrast control, shaping your light, controlling it, using teasers, using top light sources, all these things to be able to keep it off the white walls, and then using art direction, whether it's pictures, Christ, these are Ikea shelving units that we got for a very minimal price. They look sexy as hell when they're slightly <laughs> out of focus. Exactly. Uh, you got the Ikea lamp six, in the background. Six dollar lamps? Hell yeah. <laughs> right. The six dollar bulbs? <laughs> exactly. That's what that's in the background there. So you can, you can, you're able to take all these uh, little nuances and look, just with a little shallower depth of field, it looks like you got a high dollar mid-century modern background back there. So that's how you take a, attack a white room. It's all about light control, contrast control. If you're doing a big source like this, you need a teaser. If you're doing a, uh, where you can create an environment, you need a top light source so you can keep the light off the walls and then you can make it super sexy and throw some blue tubes in there and you know, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> uh, Kessler says hi. <laughs> Eric Kessler, how are you? Great to see you, my friend. My God, it has been years since we've hooked up. Uh, let's see here. Um, get through some questions here. Thanks, uh, Dave, for doing the operating. <laughs> you rock, Weldon. Okay. Here, um, great house. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, one of the pros and cons of being represented as a cinematographer by a talent agency, and do you think it would be appropriate to reach out to them directly? Ah, great question, Stephen. Okay, so the way this works is, 
And I, this was a spotlight coaching question that I got three months ago. This was the opening question from a member. So I'm sharing this uh, with you uh, because I, first off the bat, I, you know, it's, it was different than when I was coming up the ladder. So I wanted to call my agent and find out how the best way to uh, go. So you will know when you need to seek an agent. Okay. And okay, Shane, how am I going to know? You're going to know because you're getting so many calls that you cannot physically balance your schedule and keep it all straight. That's when you know you need an agent. Prior to that happening, you do not need an agent. Okay? So no matter if you think your stuff is as good as Roger Deacon's, if the phone's not ringing, you're obviously not there. So you're not seeking an agent till you cannot balance your schedule. This is exactly what my agent told me. Then you reach out. Now, how do you reach out? They say they get a ton of blind emails a day. And those blind emails become blind to them. Okay? So how can you make it not blind to them? Well, you have to do the research of the agency. You have to understand who the agents are. You pre-select the one that you want as your agent. You know the roster. And when you write this letter, you write it from your heart. You've done the research. You say, uh, you write down who the directors you want to work with, what stuff you love to shoot, you start to create this kind of dreamscape of you as an artist. The projects you are, are inspired to shoot, what ones you want to stay away from, what ones are, you know, you want to challenge yourself and push yourself out of your comfort zone. You also understand their roster and say what really makes, the, why you want to be represented by them because their roster f feels like a good fit. And you wanna understand who your agent is and do the research on who you specifically are requesting. That makes it 25% the possibility of getting it in the door, okay? So if you've increased your possibilities 25% by doing all that intel. The way that you really break down the barrier is if you're starting to get all this work and you can't really balance it all and you're obviously being called back from commercial to commercial or music video to music video, this is where you go to your producer that has been doing so much with you and you ask that producer to reach out to the agent in your name. This is a 75% uh, slam dunk for you. So you've gone from lighting a ge writing a generic email. Oh no, you've gone from thinking that you need an agent when your phone is not ringing. Nope, don't do it. Your phone is ringing and you think you need an agent now. You send the blind email. It's going to be blind. You do the research on the agency and the agent that you want representing you and do all that intel. Now you've given yourself a 25% success rate. But then if you take that producer that's really been loving how you're working and really sees how you work and how efficient you are and the imagery and they can talk about it other than yourself. Talk about how you work, how you collaborate, how efficient you are how you run your crew. That person talks to the agent, now you've increased your visibility 75%. So that's, that's uh, I think, a good answer to that question, as quickly as I can. Right, right, as, as quickly as Shane can provide. <laughs> uh, Curtis Boggs, hello, sir. In a small market, how do you make lightning strike? I think going oh. back to your your lightning strike moments. Yes. Uh, okay. So small market, this is very easy to do actually. And I talk about this 
Uh, I'm going to talk about a mentorship call that I had four years ago. It was with an Australian uh, AC. He was a prep tech at a rental house. And he called me up and he goes, Shane, I, I wanted to get this call with you because I've done everything you told me to do. I started at a rental house. And I go, okay, cool. So what are you up to now? He goes, yeah, well, I'm still at the rental house. I'm like, okay, so how long have you been there? He goes, five years. I said, dude, you've been there four years too long. And he, and he goes, what? You start, told me to start out at a rental house. I go, yeah, I did. That's where you <laughs> learn. But you got to get out of there. He goes, yeah, but you know, I, I go, this is how you get out of there. Okay. Tomorrow, I go, do you have uh, any jobs coming in? He goes, oh, yeah, we got this big TV show. I go, okay, are you the lead prep tech? He goes, of course I am. I've been here five years. I go, okay, great. You're in the driving seat. Four years longer than anybody else. <laughs> yeah. He goes, I'm in the driver's seat? I go, yeah, you're in the driver's seat. Okay, you're going to go to your marketing manager, and you're going to get the names of the first assistant. And you're going to call him up. And what you're going to say is, hey, I'm Jim. And I'm your prep tech at so-and-so rental house. And I just wanted a couple things. Uh, you know, um, I wanted to make sure that uh, if you have any carts, I'd love to be able to send our truck over to pick up any carts you might have. Uh, I've, I've already gone through. I labeled all your lens sets. I've done all the uh, minimal, uh, minimum depth of field on all of them. I mean, minimal focal uh, distance, you know. Uh, I, I have gone through and put all the millimeters and the, the f-stops in them, Velcro. I actually made you uh, filter tabs uh, on Velcro for you. And how do you like your coffee and what do you like for breakfast? Okay, and he goes, really? I said, yeah. The dude was there for four more days. That AC snarfed him right up, brought him on as a digital utility on that uh, TV series, and he's been working on that TV series for four years since that call. So in a small market, you use the same exact thing. A small market is a captive audience. So how do you set yourself apart? Well, you do a lot of stuff that other people aren't willing to do, which is you got to do the work. You got to invest of your time. You're going to invest in it for free. Oh my God, free. Well, I've been working in this industry for over 35 years and my wife and I totaled up the amount of time that I've worked for free and it's over seven years. So out of the 35, I've worked for over seven years for free in my career. So what you do is say you're a production company that's trying to do regional ads in the area. Well, you start to do Ripomatics based on their brand and you start doing this stuff for free and you start pushing that to the local ad agencies and to the clients. And they start to say, wow, this person went through all this to just possibly get this job? Well, you're not right for this one, but now you've made a statement. You've made a shot over the bow of the boat. And they're going to remember you. They're going to remember that you gave of your time. They're going to remember that you did the work. And they're going to reward you with that down the line. Now, if you're a cinematographer in a regional market, you can do a lot of the same things. You're going to these uh, agencies or these local production companies and you just say, hey, uh, I'm really trying to expand my, my, uh, my creative base, my, my clientele. You know, I'm willing to come in and shoot uh, anything for you, whatever you got. If you got a spot that you really don't have a lot of money for, I'd love to be able to be there for you. If your directors want to really, that are in your production company, want to expand their reels and, and uh, do some spec spots, I'd be all on board to providing 
uh, my resources, whether I own a camera or whether I leverage my camera house that's been so good to me. I go to my crew and I ask my crew, you know, this is really going to help my career and it's going to expand my, my, uh, my, my um, clientele base. Uh, will you come in and donate your time? And all of them do. They all are, if they're with you and you've been very good to them and you have supported them throughout their career and been there for the Christmas parties, seeing their kids grow up, supporting their families, all this kind of stuff, they are going to bend over backwards. So spec ads are a great way to really expand your uh, knowledge and your clientele. And we have, within the Filmmakers Academy, we have a whole masterclass on how to uh, design and develop that relationship and create spec spots. Jordan Brady, who's our commercial director, we have a huge commercial directing wing within the, Her the Filmmakers Academy. And this, he really is no nonsense, and that's what I love about him. He really, really, understands how to work with the agency, work with the client, how to shape the, the, uh, the, the locations so the client picks exactly what he wants. You know, it's like all these kind of beautiful things and he breaks it down in a two and a half hour masterclass all on spec spots. It, it's, it's insanely good. Uh, he shares a lot of the spec spots that he did in the past. He looks at other directors that did spec spots, shows what they did well, shows what they didn't do well. So these are ways to kind of create that lightning strike in a regional market. Uh, this is interesting. Here's Papert coming in here with his, his little comment. I remember him talking about this on his live stream. Uh, the, the myriad adventures you have is shame. My brief time on Active Valor was trying to do the steady cam shot with a Harrier jet blasting me on the flight deck. <laughs> <laughs> then just jumping from a Panaflex to a 5D from shot to shot. It's exactly. <laughs> what that was yeah i i brought uh we called him chew pap at the time uh chew pap and his steady cam and he's slinging the panaflex and we got harrier jets lifting off we got uh you know night stalker helicopters we got f-16s flying off the flight deck and then i get this wild idea where i'm like i want the light to change hey i i call out to the um the guy the uh captain of the ship I said can you do donuts and he was like what <laughs> and I go can you do donuts with this thing I want interactive light I want the light and the shadows to be moving he goes I'm sure and my god he cut that thing into a donut and we the centrifugal force was so amazing we were all leaning to the side as that baby and he started doing like 600 yard donuts and the <laughs> light was swirling and the background i mean it was just horizon of the ocean obviously but the light interaction was awesome oh my god it was so good but yeah charles was out there with me on that deck and getting blown to shit as he always has been and <laughs> delivered an amazing uh shot sequence for me so thank you chupap i appreciate your excellence <laughs> jose good to see you buddy uh his question for you is oh, <laughs> serious like sure i have some thoughts on that on excellence uh how to keep your vision of color con and contrast etc while a project takes on different hands after principal photography is complete so how do you keep your vision of color and and, and everything that you've planned yeah so um the cinematographer's job is not done after we complete the movie. So we have a prep process, we have a production process, and then we also have the post process. And the post process can be as involved as it is as you want it to be or not. I've had movies where I've been off on uh, shooting another movie and I've had to, you know, zoom in basically. Uh, back then I didn't have zoom. Uh, we basically set up a camera in my um, in a post-production facility that I would go to, and then they would stream uh, the color uh, from that 
from Dave Cole's Bay in Los, Los Angeles to my bay in Atlanta or wherever the hell I was. Prague, I did the last one. I even did one in Thailand. So this is, you know, so if you're on a movie, there's always ways to continue to maintain and uh, finesse and, and keep your craft uh, in the vision succinct with what the director and you have come up with. Um, I, you know, like Musica, I have from February uh, 9th to February 23rd uh, to be able to color correct that film. I will be there every day for eight to 10 hours. I, I, it used to be when I was first doing the process and it was very new, we would do monolith 12 and 14 hours. And what you end up doing is completely destroying yourself and destroying your eyes. So what I do now from a color-based session, and this is kind of good advice because I failed at it very early on, so I want to kind of share that knowledge uh, and wisdom that I learned. What you want to do is you want to get out of that goddamn room as much as possible, okay? And what you do is you take breaks. So if you come in in the morning, say 9 a.m., and you want to take your first break that you just get out go to the bathroom, go grab a coffee, probably an hour and a half, two hours in. Let those eyes reset, and then come back into the room. Then you wanna reset for lunch. Now, back in the day, we used to eat the lunch in the room, the dinner in the room. You're just in that dark environment, eating your food. You can't see your damn food. You can't see what the hell you're eating. And you're just shoveling it in there because you got to keep the room dark. My colorist is eating and coloring. That's not any way to, uh, you know, color a movie. But this is how we did it in the beginning. So I take an hour to eat lunch outside usually. So it was, if it's a nice day, I try to go outside, fresh air, recalibrate the eyes. Then go back into the room. Then you're going to take another coffee break or a snack break or something before you eventually quit in eight hours. The 10, the 12, the 14 hour days, those are done in regards to how I've seen, how I'm able to do it. And this was kind of a, a real uh, enlightening experience on fathers and daughters. I was color grading at Light Iron in New York and I only had four days to grade that film. So, and their process to grading was an eight hour day. That's all that was budgeted. So I had to be organized and move at a quick pace, but at the same time, constantly re you know, uh, reinvigorating the eyes, resetting those eyes. So that was a, a big game changer for me. So that was like 2011, 13. Uh, and then ever since that, I have been taking these breaks and only making them eight hours. Uh, so, but this is an investment in, of your time because uh, back in the day when it was first started out, the whole DI, digital intermediate process, you were never paid uh, as a cinematographer. Now I'm paid half my rate uh, for going in and doing it. So whatever I was paid on a, on a weekly, I only get half of that for the color grading. And that's pretty a, kind of a standard thing. So, but um, in the beginning, you're gonna have to do it for free. You're gonna have to give of your time. You're gonna have to invest in that, prop, in that product. And this is the thing that I learned really early on. This is your coming out party. This is your, you know, if, the, if you believe in this product and, and this film or this commercial, this music video, whatever, you got to invest in that. And if it means you doing that time for free to oversee and make sure the vision is exactly what you and the director talked about, then you got to take the time to be able to do that, whether you're paid or whether it's for free. That's a good answer. Um... Can you talk about lighting for underwater into the blue? How, how, did that, how did you work that out? Yeah, that was a, uh, an incredible experience for me. Um, I had never shot underwater. Um, and, uh, you know, 
other than like a music video. I mean, I did Come As You Are with the little baby in the swimming pool. I did uh, some commercials where we had some underwater shots, but not, I mean, 99 days underwater we did on Into the Blue. That's a lot. Um, and it was super exhausting and super rewarding at the same time. Come, so, come, come as you are. That was the the jumping video, right? The, no, or, that no. was the one where they he was dangling from a um, from a chandelier, and we had the whole set was oh, yeah. dripping okay. water down the walls and everything. And then you had the baby swimming in the pool with the right. the hook of the dollar leading the the child in the pool uh so which became their uh, you know iconic cover of that album uh and then we took that song which Kirk Corbain said this is uh, Kirk Cobain said this is what he wrote it for this was the image that came to him he had. so yeah that's how we kind of uh talked. sorry to derail that question there but I'm <laughs> back to the, the blue um so what I did was we were in the the uh, that was 2004. So we were in this or two. Yeah. Two, no, 2003. This was the weird transition where uh, Star Wars had been shot. That second uh, trilogy. They had all done it on the Panavision camera with the Sony uh, F950. Right. Uh, with with and, both stops the dynamic range? <laughs> yes, yeah, with two stops the dynamic range. Um, and they were, um, you know, they created a whole uh, lens l uh, line for the, the Sony. And um, so Al Giddings, who was Pete Goober's friend uh, at MGM and had done The Abyss with James Cameron and done, you know, a lot of amazing uh, movies underwater. Um, that's who they wanted to shoot it, and he wanted to go all digital underwater. You know, more downtime, didn't have to reload mags, uh, you know, um, much more easier workflow, all this kind of stuff. So I said, all right, let's stage a shootout. I'll bring Al Giddings down to the Bahamas. I'll bring Pete Zuccarini in, who had never done a movie, had only done commercials, and he was based out of Miami. I gave him the same actors that had the same, uh, the, the, the models that had amazing swimming abilities, could free dive, could do all that stuff. I gave him the same outfits, so the same board shorts, the same bikinis. And I said, Al, you show me how you're going to make underwater look and feel. And Pete Zuccarini, you show me how you're going to make it feel. And then we, without any guidance, you know, I just said, this is, I go, I told them, this is how I want the movie to feel. I want the movie to feel unlike any underwater movie we've ever seen before. I want us to be a helicopter, a technocrane, a dolly, uh, you know, all, we want to move with the people underwater. We want to ebb and flow. I don't want to pan, I want to be able to pan 360 degrees. I want to be able to put an eight mil in an underwater housing and see the clouds, the surface, the mid ground and the sand of the, the ocean floor all in one shot. I said, okay, wow me. So they had two days to do this. And of course, the conditions on in the Bahamas when we shot this, we never got them again on the movie. It was absolute glass. The viz level was 97 feet. You could see forever. It was unbelievable. So we brought back these imagers and we sat in the MGM theater and I had Peter Goober there and myself and John Stockwell, the director, and he saw digital versus film. And we didn't tell him which was film and we didn't tell him what was digital. And all of a sudden he stood up and he said, what is that? And I said, that's film.
and he goes, I love it. They're alive. They have skin tones. They're, they're vivacious. They're, they look young. This is going to be amazing. And the way the camera, I've never seen a camera move like that. And that was Pete Zuccarini. And that was the genesis of how we made that movie. We shot all on film. We had four underwater housings. So we could just, uh, and all, you know, I had like four or five different sets of cook primes. So we could put, if we wanted to say on a 21, then we would have four 21s and he would just go up and go down. And we didn't have to reload. We could just ha send him a new housing. So we increased our bottom time, huge. Then he made his underwater housings like missiles. So they were not this big clunky thing that were, was much designed. Uh, they were like a missile. So they moved through the water so much better. Then we engineered dome housings for the eight mil that was this wide. So I could shoot and see the clouds, the horizon, the, the water level, the mid-ground, and the sand floor of the ocean. And then how I lit it. See how I'm finally getting to the lighting? Uh, <laughs> no. um, how we lit it was because I wanted Pete Zuccarini and Paul Walker, God rest his soul, I love that man to death, James Kahn and, and Jessica Alba. I wanted him to move everywhere. And I wanted the camera to spin 360 degrees. Well, if we have lights on the ground, then we're not going to be able to move. So what I did is if we were doing night, they had flashlights. And I reached out to Jacques Cousteau. I don't know if any of you know this man, but he basically created the whole underworld, underwater shooting environment for National Geographic. He was the most prolific underwater films maker uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he designed all of our lights underwater. So they, they look like missiles as well. So they could hold them and carry them. They weren't these flashlights that had been used for underwater. They had a long bottom time as well. So they could go for six, eight hours uh, without having to be charged. So we started putting flashlights in their hands so they could start to light themselves. Then the, Into the Blue was all about treasure hunting. So what I did is I engineered a whole medley of lights. So what I felt like is if this was a treasure hunting boat, they were gonna have treasure hunting embedded lights so they could treasure hunt during the day or the night. So what I did is I took 1200 PARs that were uh, hydroflex uh, pars and suspended them in the water. And then I did a tungsten par right next to it. So you had daylight and tungsten, daylight, tungsten, daylight, tungsten that went around the whole boat. And they were rigged just with stands over the side. And then we would just, uh, you know, lower it down we didn't hard rig anything, just lowered it down on the head extension so it would move with the ocean. So now imagine this boat is on the water, it's underneath and we put them down like eight to 10 feet so they didn't bash into the hull of the boat. So now when they're down there searching for treasure, they got their flashlight. If it's not lit, all of a sudden these lights swing across the the sunken treasure and then swing back and then it might be a daylight one that swings through and then a tungsten and then when they're not uh the sea is not violent they're just a beautiful mix of this tonality that fills into the shadows and you can see each individual little nuance and then we have the flashlight to then uh you know toss gasoline on whatever they found, you know, so we can really see it. So this was how I lit all of Into the Blue. Now on our first day of when we were doing the shootout, I did this uh, to test the, the, the uh, idea. So I said, uh, you know, and uh, Pete Zuccarini goes, so you're not going down with us to light the scene? I go, no, I don't have to go down with you. And he goes, 
how. I said, I see where you are with the camera and I'm going to light by knowing where your camera placement is and where the talent is. I can do it because, okay, sorry, I'm done with you. Uh, because every blocking schematic I create is a top-down view. And once you know where the actors are, it educates you where the light should go. So I lit the whole thing from never entering the water. And Zuccarini comes up from that shooting that test and he goes this is some of the best underwater lighting I have ever shot what are you doing he goes everything at the tonalities the colors the way it's moving the way it looks on their skin I mean I just never seen anything like this before and that was just all from what I learned as a gaffer, what I learned as a cinematographer, trying to look at it from a bird's eye point of view, knowing where your cameraman is, knowing where he's gonna move to, and how to shape that light was all done from above. And that gave me the ability to show you as an audience how the camera could move 360 degrees absolutely seamlessly without ever putting one light on the, on the floor of the ocean. I, I want to briefly take a moment and just pat you on the the shoulder because you know we, we talked about you know you you showing some some photos and some BTS and all like that. We don't need it. You are so vivid in your descriptions and your memory is is tack sharp. I mean, <laughs> you're better than I mean, you're literally telling everybody this is how I'm going to light it. And it's literally how you lit it. It's 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 amazing. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> no, it's like uh, I, I that's my wife calls me the elephant. Uh, <laughs> oh, we got one from Phil Holland. Oh, Mr. Holland, yeah. So on a particular feature shoot, could you recall a difficult scene to tackle logistically or creatively? Just something, I guess, really difficult you had to come over. Um, I mean, throwing lights underwater is probably one of them. But <laughs> well, that, that was a difficult process, uh, that whole thing. And, you know, logistically of being on the water and literally talking to every ASC member that had shot him maybe on water and said, you're gonna go over budget. You're gonna go over days. You're gonna do all this. And I'm like, well, how did, how did you do it? He goes, well, I had a big boat and this big boat became your, your, like your resources. And that big boat uh, was, you were able to tie off your your boat that you're shooting on the water and manipulate it and move it around. And I was like, okay. So that's what we did the first day. Guess what we did the second day, Phil and Scott? <laughs> we fucking sent that boat packing back to harbor and I never saw the goddamn thing again. Because the minute I started to move more than 90 degrees, there was the goddamn big Helen B in the shot. And, you know, John Stockwell, the director, is like, like you told me we were going to be able to move around. You told me. I go, that was underwater, but we're on top side. No, it's the same. Underwater, above side. we got to move around 360s. And I'm like, okay, we're getting rid of that boat. And we created this boat called the Corinthian, which had two 500 Honda motors, you know, uh, motors on the back of it. It had a little uh, bathroom that you could go in the bathroom. It was 14 feet wide and 45 feet long. And it held a 15 camera working package. Eight underwater housings, one uh, condor, or one camera on the 30 foot techno crane with a flight head, one in the aqua cam housing on a Foxy that had the cantilevering a uh, uh, pivot point so we could move the fulcrum to to push the aqua cam underneath the water to disperse all that uh, you know that that volume and then we had two in handheld studio mode one on the steady cam these things were like guns on a rack all you know shooting film so we were able to just grab whatever we wanted that was a massive undertaking and a huge learning experience for me because I invested all this HMI and my gaffer 
and him having all these lights on this Helen B big ship. We never pulled one of those goddamn lights out ever. Uh, so this was a big learning experience for me. I wanted, I chose to have the camera move in unique ways and I also spun the boat, anchored it to this little uh, flotilla that we had where we had our whole team, hair, makeup, wardrobe, everyone was on this thing. Two cranes, you know, two underwater teams. We, we were able to just manipulate it with that and it gave me the ability to deliver John Stockwell's vision. So that was a very logistical, uh, massive movie to kind of understand. I didn't have the experience. I asked uh, a lot of advice. My advice was completely shit canned by the director. So it's like all the wisdom of many uh, cinematographers uh, be basically was on the cutting room floor and I had to come up with a new style. And that new style was very much what, once I set the style of shooting in motion in 2003, I have never stopped that style from this day. And every director says, I've never come across anything like this. You mean I can just ask for something and it's already ready? I go, yeah. Think of it as guns on the rack. Do you want the Ronin gun? Do you want the flight head gun? Do you want the Technocrane gun? Do you want the drone gun? Do you want the, you know, everything is ready. And what it does is because converting on set is where you die. I can light faster than my camera team can convert. So once I realize that, I'm like, okay, we got to have a lot more cameras so we don't have to do any of this converting because I'm lighting faster than they can convert. So once that happened, it became, you know, the Shane show of showing up with 19 cameras, showing up with 21 <laughs> cameras, Need for Speed, showing up with 87 cameras. Okay, 87 cameras that my team had to manage. I had eight first ACs on that. Just to be able to manage all those cameras, to be able to maintain them, clean them, you know, uh, understand how to use all different formats because we shot multiple formats on that movie as well. Um, so Into the Blue was a logistical uh, challenge. Um, I would say Need for Speed was again one of those uh, huge challenges because Scotty Waugh, our director, did not want to do Fast and the Furious, which basically Fast and the Furious is just a video game with actors on a green screen. No one's jumping out of stuff, no one's crashing cars, no one's flying them, you know, uh, a Mustang over four lanes of traffic and landing in a parking lot in a church. Okay, none of that shit was done on any of those damn movies. It's all in these little vibro kind of things and they're just moving the shit around and it's all in a green world. Well, he wanted to do everything practical because Scott Waugh was a stunt man turned director and he wanted to make this uh, assign his team of stunt coordinators and all his uh, stunt players that had been so good to him over the years he brought them all in and that's what we made Need for Speed with not one green screen shot in it so I, I, everything was practical and every camera that I had was rigged on camera and cars that were literally spinning over and over again. And literally, you know, everything that my key grip, my camera team, suction cups, speed rail and everything was literally just bent to shit and blown apart on every stunt. Because Scotty says no one has ever put a camera on something that's not a GoPro. That's not some action cam that we can just blow up. Let's put $50,000 cameras on a car in three different positions and hit it from behind and have it spin and rotate and just rip and tear those cameras apart and see the sparks and all that stuff embedded in it. And we did it all practically. Now, need for uh, you know Fast and the Furious and Transformers and all the Michael Bay stuff, they do a lot of this practically as well. But for this, it was, everything was designed around the stunt extraordinaire experience of doing it all in camera. 
So you're saying if you had Komodo back in Need for Speed, you'd have 167 cameras? Yeah, probably. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I had, I had, what did I have? I had 20 to 40 GoPros on that movie. And then we had asked GoPro, we went directly to GoPro, and they created the hack for us, which all of you are using now on your GoPro 10 and the 11. Pull out the... Uh, I was able to... Uh, you know, pick my ISO, I was able to pick my shutter speed, I was able to pick all that stuff that back in, you know, 2013, 2014, you didn't have any control. It was auto. So we uh, worked with GoPro, so we were able to go in there and hack. I used diopters on them. I used ND filters before ND filters were ever used on them uh, to be able to lose the, the hyper shutter. Um, you know, we really immersed those, those cameras in it. Then I used the 1DC as a 4K capture as my crash camera so I could literally just land, you know, speeding cars at 100 miles an hour and just crash, hit them head on. Uh, and then we also made crash housings for the C500s that were these black boxes with roll cages and everything. Uh, actually, in Need for Speed, that one... Uh, the grasshopper jump in Need for Speed with the uh, Ford Mustang where he jumped over four lanes of traffic uh, and landed in a parking lot. He told me where to put the camera. X marks the spot. It was a beautiful fluorescent, uh, you know, yellow or fluorescent orange. And that's where I put the camera. And good enough, that guy hit it square. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't fly over it like he said. He hit it square on, and that C500 in that beautiful uh, roll cage and black box became 6,000 pieces, and some homeless guy down the street came up to us with a shopping cart, and he had the PL mount with the <laughs> sensor mounted to the 14 mil cook, and he handed it over to us uh, in the parking lot. So that, you know, from a logistical standpoint, was probably one of the most uh, difficult jobs I had to do as a cinematographer because I had to figure out how to embed all these cameras, how to uh, create color space profiles so the GoPro didn't feel like a GoPro, the DSLR didn't feel like a DSLR, and, you know, uh, the Airy and the C500 molded together so you didn't think one was, you know, this was where, you know, camera technology was pretty far out. You know, the Canon looked different than the Airy and the Red looked different than all of them. You know, they were not close. Uh, so this was uh, a very huge undertaking. It was also the time when I did that big, um, you know, shootout before anyone was really doing these. So I did the Canon C500, the Airy Alexa. I shot 35 millimeter. I shot uh, DSLRs. I shot GoPros. I shot, uh, you know, all the, the Sony F950. Uh, I shot all the cameras of the era, digital cameras and film. And we shot, went in a theater where none of them were, uh, you know, none of the uh, cameras were were on the slates. And we showed Scotty Waugh and Steven Spielberg the cameras. And they all pointed to this specific camera that they wanted to shoot the movie on. And they all thought it was film, and it happened to be the Canon C500. Uh, and <laughs> that's what we ended up being our A camera on that job. So. Car Carlos is happy because what he got out of that whole Need for Speed discussion is that he gets to have more cameras and he's going to let his wife know immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then there was <laughs> another comment here I wanted to get to before I got to the next question because I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, where is it? Oh, it was art. I can't find it. Um, he said that his wife, uh, yeah, there we go. His wife really loves the way you talk. Should he be concerned? <laughs> <laughs> Art Claggett, how are you doing? I love Art. Art has Art is been amazing. with us since the Shane Inner Circle days. Um, you know, he was running a kind of a still facility 
uh, in, in Pennsylvania, and I uh, met him uh, within the Illumination Experience Tour that I went to like 26 cities across yep. the United States and Canada, as well as a lot of meetups that I did on the East Coast, and Art has been a shining star within our academy. Uh, I really appreciate all his uh, hard work and excellence and what he also does for our community. He hires a lot of our Filmmaker Academy he members uh, to, and now he's expanded his whole still into motion, uh, and he's just crushing it. So he, kudos He's to a you, wonderful Robert. human being. He really yes, is. He is. Uh, so the question that I cannot find in here somewhere, but they, they were asking about day for night. So... What are your thoughts on shooting day day for night? Uh, and is can you do it? Is it practical, or should you just do night? Okay, so there's going to be movies and the scale of the movie that needs for it requires you to shoot day for night. Like uh, so, let's say Dune. Okay, Dune. They had to do day for night for that because. All you have is these dunes everywhere, and you cannot light for miles, right? So there's films that you're going to have to do day for night because it's the, the, the way the script is describing, the shots that are required to tell the story are going to push you day for night. Um, so I did day for night on Into the Blue a little bit with the um, the boat at night going across the water. Uh, I somewhat failed in doing that. Uh, I Because with day for night photography, you want to always set your backlight up uh, as the sun. So just like you would do if you were lighting a night scene, you always have your edge. You always have that backlight edge, which is quote unquote moonlight. And then you have the ambience, which is like whatever is bouncing off trees or houses or whatever, that it's the moon ambience. And then obviously you have the practical elements, whether you got a sodium vapor or a high pressure, uh, or I mean a, a metal halide or whatever your practical source is uh, with your night work. So. So you always set that three-quarter backlight up uh, as the sun for for night or for day for night. Well, that wasn't a good thing for on the water because what does a backlight do on the water? Well, it gives you the sheen for a goddamn you know seven thousand miles, right? And that sheen is so hot that even though when you crush it down that specular highlight on the water is going to be way too powerful. So what I should have done on the water is I should have used the sun as a side light uh, in that scenario. So I could have a darker sky, I could use the polarizer to uh, lose the reflection of the sky so I could bring that down and then the side light felt like moonlight but just being side lit in the water. So if you're shooting on water and you're gonna do day for night, do not do it as backlight. So every one of these situations have, has kind of a, a different cocktail. I did day for night in a very unique way on Terminator Salvation. So the story that was being told was they need to come out and test this jammer, okay? They, they have learn some intel within the resistance that they can hopefully uh, jam the hunter killers, terminators uh, communication system. So what they do is they put a car way out in the middle of the desert, they blow it up, the hunter killer comes over it, and then it's, it's within a close uh, assembly and then they use this uh, radio jammer to see if they can jam its signal. Well, think about that. I need to be able to see the vast desert uh, of the landscape of Terminator Salvation. I need to be able to see that truck 
out in the distance. I need to be able to see them up on the hillside. I need to be able to see them have a, uh, you know, a RPG in their hands. I need to be able to see the hunter killer hover over it and then come towards them and then finally jam the signal and it sends the hunter killer down into the ground and crashes. So that is lighting 20 square miles. But like I said, in the movie Dune, you can't do that. So I tried to set myself up for success as much as possible by angling the sun to three quarter backlight trying to use as much negative fill as possible to take down all the ambience, the, the sky ambience, because obviously that sky ambience does not exist at night. And then adding bounces to be able to fill in their face to manicure it to feel like the moon ambience. So basically what you're doing is you're trying to create what you do for night photography within a day environment. I wanted it to look very unique, so I didn't go for the blue tones. I actually went for these purple magenta tonalities within Terminator Salvation to kind of make this world of, of how the machines have taken over just feel a little bizarre, right? And a little like, wow, this is not of this time. Uh, and I think it worked very well. Now, the unfortunate thing is is where we were shooting was very difficult to get to. We had taken a much later call because we went very late in that day prior to shooting this day for night. So my plan was scarred because we didn't get Christian Bale and Common up to that hillside till the sun was completely overhead at 78 degrees. So as much backlight I was giving them, it was basically top light. And a lot of the times they had, you know, the underbelly of, you know, turning to him. And now all of a sudden he's skull died from that, uh, you know, um, top light. So I embraced it, tried to create as much negative fill up there and bounce light. And I think it comes off very well uh, because of the color tonality and everything that we gave it. But those are kind of the rules for day for night. How you would light that night environment is how you want to set up your day environment. You're trying to take away as much sky ambience as possible. You're trying to set your backlight just like your moonlight edge would be, a, either dead back or I like more three quarter backlight. I like to wrap the uh, source around from the same side. So my backlight, my edge light is on the same side as my key light. And then I try and neg fill the other side. So taking away as much skylight as possible. So that's how I light my actors. And then when you're doing mass landscapes that maybe is, you know, a car driving, everything has to be dialed in. So the car that's driving has to have super bright headlights. Right? So you got to engineer the headlights to be super bright. Anything that you're putting in a house, if you see a house in the background, you got to literally make that house windows a nuclear reactor. So I, I mean, I've done day for night photography where I've put like, you know, 5Ks, 10Ks in the ceiling to backlight and glow the... Um, the the uh, shears and curtains because when I take it all down and post those shears will still be illuminated like they would be if uh, it was nighttime right so these are all the little tricks of the trade that you learn to do remember if if you're creating this day environment every source that you put up if there's a source in the shot it's got to be super bright because you're gonna bring those levels way down and that light still has to feel like it's from the house and, and uh, a practical source. I, I remember one of the things you had said was use gray shears because... Yeah, well using gray shears when you're doing night work that's not day for night because most of the time you're gonna have a moonlight source or a practical urban source through there and if you have white shears, they just explode. 
and they explode and they explode into the room. And if you're trying to do any kind of streak lighting within the room for moonlight, those things just glow and they just draw your eye. Where if you use gray curtains, they end up being a beautiful kind of desaturated white once your moonlight source hits them. So it doesn't look like they're gray. It just looks like they're a mundane white tonality that doesn't draw your eye. So it keeps it where you want your audience to actually look. Uh, Kessler had texted me and wanted you to know he truly misses you. And those were some exciting times back in the day. <laughs> he had to run. <laughs> um, this is a good, good timely question from Art. How rewarding is it to see students of your efforts to succeed? Illumination Tour, uh, Inner Circle, Filmmakers Academy, et cetera. You, you kind of briefly talked on that with Art. But, but yeah, so how does it feel it, for you? Oh, it, it's, you know, Scott, it is one of the most amazing things you can imagine. Because what's happening right now is we have so many Filmmaker Academy members all over the world. So when I went to Prague, I just started, you know, hooking people up. And I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I see you're in Prague, you're a Filmmakers Academy, you're an Inner Circle member, whatever it was at the time. Uh, what, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm a first AC. I'm like, so I bring him in for the interview. You know, I go up to Vancouver, tons of Filmmaker Academy members there. I'm hiring my gimbal tech, my gimbal operator, my first AC, my camera operator, my steady cam operator, they're all have been Inner Circle, Hurlman Academy, and Filmmaker Academy members. They have drink, they're drinking the Kool-Aid. They've learned how I talk and, and the short uh, hand that I have. So now it's like working with one beautiful big family. And Tom Sigurdsson, who was uh, and it, one of my first Inner Circle members that ever signed up in 2014. He is now my gaffer. Brendan Reel, who I ended up, he called me up and he goes, Shane, you know, I follow you on the Hurl blog and I saw that you went to Emerson College. Can you put in a good word for me? Sure. I called Emerson College. He got in. He came out. He wanted to do an internship with us. The minute he came out of college, he went in and he worked for us for two years at the Hurlbut Academy. And now he's my key grip. He's almost walking in my footsteps where he understood how awesome it is to be a key grip. He's got his own truck like I had. He's got all his gizmos and specialty gear. And Tom, he was he wanted to be a DP. He went out and bought an Aria Alexa Mini. He bought all this kind of stuff. I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, what do you, you know, those things are great, but sell that shit. Start to build yourself as an electrician. Learn from other gaffers. Then move up and become that gaffer and start to build your truck and everything. And now he's doing so many commercials and feature films and they've become part of my team. And it's absolutely so rewarding to see all these members that have been so uh, kind and uh, appreciative to me. Uh, they're able to uh, experience this and it's all come kind of full circle where now they are delivering their excellence to make all of us shine as a group. And uh, it's probably the most single, most rewarding thing that could ever happen to uh, a cinematographer is to be surrounded with people that uh, have learned from you, have invested in their education, invested in themselves, and understand how difficult it is to make it in this industry and that they uh, also know that they have to do the work. And I push that huge. You, you don't come up through the Shane Hurlbut school and do not work. <laughs> I love it. Um, Josh's journey, he wants to know, uh, hear your standpoint uh, and get to know, the, I guess, the state of green film productions in the States. Uh, it's become a must in Germany that that every film is is green. What what have you, what have you seen? What are you hearing? What's happening in the, in that world? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, back when uh, biodiesel was like, you know, completely faux pas, I was one of the first, um, you know, cinematographers that asked my gaffer to always do biodiesel. That was like a first, you know, uh, I, you know, we were still burning 18Ks and all these big lights, uh, but now we are at least doing it on biodiesel. Once the LED market came in, that was a big, uh, you know, green infusion to our industry, obviously, because, you know, like I have here, uh, I have a lot of lights blazing and I'm firing it. I don't have a generator. I'm plugging all this stuff into the wall. So that has been a game changing event for our industry to go green. I think our industry is not doing so well on the water still. Uh, I just see so many, you know, um, productions that are still wasting a ton of paper, even though everything that I generate is paperless. Um, we're still hanging on to paper like it's, uh, you know, the, the dark ages. Uh, I think uh, the water thing too, water bottles, all that kind of stuff, having many more places to just refill that water bottle so we're not putting more plastic into our oceans and and the waste of, of it all. I think the consumerization of the world is like, I'll, I'll never forget the day when, you know, if you bought a record player, okay, and I'm going way back here, and that record not player- too far, Not too far, not too far. <laughs> that, that record player broke, you took it to the stereophonic shop down the road and they fixed it. And by fixing it wasn't the same price as the device that you purchased. Now it's cheaper to buy another device yeah. than actually get it fixed. So these are the kind of things that, you know, our consumerism that has happened, uh, we definitely have to find a way out of this because I think it's gonna sink us as, as humans. But um, my practice on set, my green film production, is still to do a mix of both. Um, our, the technology is still not there to create the sun with an LED. I'm sorry, it just does not exist. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> uh, not yet. And it does not exist to throw an LED six football fields either. It just does not exist. So uh, there is still what I call the old school ways and the new school ways of lighting. And that is what I embr have embraced. There's times when you got to use the 18Ks and the big guns. There's times when you need to do the Dino lights and the Condors. And there's times when you can light it all with the Steras and a couple light tiles and you're off to the races. Uh, so, you know, it's like, I find that a lot of the young cinematographers are not understanding that you need to use these large tools to succeed. You know, I mean, Chivo, uh, Roger Deakins, Bob Richardson, uh, you know, um, they're not using LED lights for everything that they do. They're using 18Ks, they're using 24 light dinos, they are using ray beams, they are using these large sources that take a lot of power because that's what it takes to light a massive environment that is on the coast of the, the uh, Jersey Shore in uh, like Empire of the Light. And there needs that light to come through the space. And it has to be created with, with large sources that are, are much bigger than just some S360s. But there are times when, you know, lighting green screens has become super uh, green because you can light them with sky panels or cineos or you know uh, LED uh, space lights and LED sky pans and all this stuff that has taken the old technology and retrofitted it into uh, the LED world. But um, I think a, a great cinematographer should not poo-poo the past, uh, just like. I researched everything that George Harrell did and Alfred Hitchcock and Orson Welles did uh, back and how they placed the lens, how they composed it. 
uh, Greg Tolan on how he lends and uses shadow and contrast and shaping the light. These are things that you, you don't poo-poo that. You, you, you study the masters. And just like the, the lights that are starting to become of age, you still study them and understand that quality of light. And then, you know, see how you can then try to recreate that with the LED technology that you have at your arsenal. Uh, but yeah, these are, these are things that, you know, it's a big swing within our industry. And I just want uh, our younger cinematographers to understand that they need to learn HMI and tungsten. Because you know what the CRI value is on an HMI and a tungsten? 100. <laughs> yep, indeed. Condor Blue, makers of some very fine accessories. They ask, Shane, what is your favorite genre to shoot? Ooh, favorite genre, I would say, is drama. Like shooting fathers and daughters, uh, shooting a Casa Tuta Bene, uh, the Rat Pack, period dramas, like the greatest game was exciting. Uh, and I think uh, sports genre, the sports dramas are my, those drama and sports dramas are my favorite because I played almost every sport. So I really understand how to get in there. I was more of a jock. I was not the, the dude in drama society or doing the lighting board for the drama department or worrying about numbers and X's and O's and ones and zeros. I was more the jock, you know, I played sports, uh, basketball, baseball, soccer, football, tennis, golf. I played semi-pro soccer uh, in the late 80s, I mean in the early 80s. Uh, I played college baseball and soccer. Uh, these, so I love the sports genre. I love getting inside the pitcher's mind and the hitter's mind and the play, get inside the golfer's mind because that was very much on how we took apart greatest game was even though it was a period piece, Bill Paxton said he wanted a very uh, cosmopolitan look to how the camera moved. He didn't want it to be moved like we were in 1912 and, and stay true to form to the genre and the time period. He wanted us to move with the ball. So when the ball was hit, we were flying with it for 300 or 400 yards and then landing and you know, going across the fairway. And he wanted to get inside the, the, the mind of Harry Varden. So Harry Varden steps up to the ball. He takes the trees and the fairway and turns it into a lynx course. So he has no obstacles. He can just see the hole. Uh, Shia LaBeouf brought the hole right to his, his face so he could see it, you know? And then Ted Ray was like, uh, he was the master blaster. So we wanted you, when he hit the ball, it wanted to feel like he was punching the camera in the face, punching you as the audience in the face. So this, these were kind of, these are the genres I love to shoot, sports drama and drama. That's, that's cool. Uh, Ali said, uh, I think you once said you prefer the red image to any other as it is more filmic. What characteristics do you attribute to this? Okay, let me clarify that. The red image, I feel, is more photochemical based. There's more things that I can do within the red camera that I can alter what the, the end product is going to be where most of the other cameras on the market, you cannot zoom in to the sensor. You cannot create multi-formats. You cannot use the HDR function to do unique things. You can't use uh, different ways so your highlight roll-off is more extreme or medium or low. You can't use your uh, contrast to soft medium. You, these are all the things that you can go in and really uh, alter the, the uh, raw file to where it is more baked in in the process. And that's what I really love about the RED camera itself. 
It's a very small supercomputer that can do things that all the other cameras can't do. You can't shoot 300 frames per second on your Alexa Mini or your Sony Venice 2. You can't. It's impossible, right? But you can on the red. Um, you know, you, you can't zoom in on the sensor and make it look like Super 8 with the right compression. Um, you can't, um, you, you can't uh, take it and go to 3K and say, okay, I'm going to make this look like Super 16 and I'll go with a 12 to 1 compression and then lower the ISO from 12,000 to 6,400. You know, all these things are super uh, powerful because the camera itself, are you bringing to me a, a prop? Ooh. Ooh, look at that. But this baby can do it all. You know, yeah. it's able to shoot at extreme frame rates. It's able to shoot so you have multi-formats. Super 16, Super 8, Super 35, Vista Vision, whatever you want, and a great anamorphic scale, which you need the height of that sensor. Uh, so these are... These are the things that, um, you know, why I respond to the red. Because I want to be able to have one camera ecosystem to do my whole production. I don't want to have to bring in a, uh, you know, if I want to do 300 frames per second, I don't want to have to bring in a, uh, you know, a... Uh, Phantom. Phantom. You know, yep. Phantom Flex 4 or whatever. I, I don't want to have to do that. I want, I, I want to have it so I can use everything within the same camera, the same sensor. So when I'm in the color correcting bay, that I can color correct very quickly. I can be super efficient. I can have time to do more of the creative stuff with windows and funnel shaped windows and circles and bringing out the eyes and bringing out the face. This is all stuff that you're giving, you know, you start to see yourself saying, okay, I'll sacrifice this right now because I know it's going to gain me much more time in uh, the color correcting bay to finesse. But it's like, that's why I like the red platform. Now, and the Alexa, the Airy, the system, the Sony, the Canon, these are all great tools. But the I'm always seeing what tool can I do the most of? And that's what I'm going to use. Everyone's like, Shane, you're like a Steadicam hater. Why is that? Well, because the Steadicam can do 10 things really well. 10. That's it. The gimbal can do 99 things. So what tool am I picking? I'm picking the 99. Why limit yourself to 10? Now, with the big, you know, uh, device that, you know, the revolution Order, thing. Or, that, or, or, what, yeah. Which one what do it? they call that, that thing? The, uh, tr the Trinity? Or the, yeah, the, the Trinity. You're yeah. able, but that's still, that's a whole other art form, right? Because now you have a post that's this long and you got to get down and you got to get up. And yes, it's starting to give you some of the abilities of a gimbal. But with a gimbal, I can be four inches off the ground and nine and a half feet in the air all in one shot. That's a crane. That's a gyro stabilized crane. You cannot do that with the Trinity. You just can't. And you can't move in tight positions with it either. So th this is, it's like I try to, you know, like and it all comes to the genesis of the DSLR. What made the DSLR so powerful? It was this small, just like this. If I didn't have this bad, bad battery back on there, even the handle, you strip this thing <laughs> down, it's still a six inch by six inch box. That's what kind of what the DSLR was. That's a kind of the Komodo, right? So you have this very small camera that you can build to as big as you want it or as small as you want it. The Venice 2 is not going to shrink down unless you have that other camera that's attached to a cord that cannot move or separate itself from it. So that's... A, that's a no-brainer, no not having that, why? 
Uh, then you have the situation where the Alexa Mini is getting smaller, but it can't do all the supercomputer yeah. stuff that this camera can do. They're, they're shrinking it, but they're having to take away at the same time. But I mean, it's still a great image. It's, it's nice. It's just, yeah, it doesn't have all that. And 300 frames per second, that's so last year. That's, that's 600 frames, and you can push it to 1,000. No, I know, but the wedge on the thousand is <laughs> well, like I mean, this. <laughs> so you shoot it vertically. You get that drip of water. That's all you need. <laughs> but yes, no, and, and that's the thing. It's like what I try to do is I try to set my directors up for success so this thing can morph into anything that they envision. And I try to do the same thing with all my cameras as guns as are on a rack. Right? These are the things that are super important for you as a cinematographer. So your, your creativity is endless. You can, you can do whatever comes at the ready. And there's a lot of times where I prep like it's, I, I'm a prep monster, but there's times in the day where you're like, you know what? The director is just, I, I just, I know this is what we talked about in prep, but you know, seeing the performance and everything, I just want to go a different way. You know, and I'm like, awesome. Can we, do we have a camera that is really super small that I can just attach to the person and they can walk around on it? Yeah. You know, it's like, I can do that. It's nothing that we ever talked about, but I can do that right now. Uh, so that's setting yourself up for success and creating your palette of tools like brushes, right? And your quiver of arrows. You know, now you have these paint brushes that you can deploy and you can ebb to flow whatever their wildest dreams are. And you have a team that you have instructed to understand that's how I roll. And because when I go and I'm showing up with 18 and 19 cameras, the camera department shits themselves. <laughs> because they've never, they, they don't, they, no one rolls out like that, right? And they're like, Shane, how are we going to be able to do this? I only have A and B camera teams. I go, trust me, it's all going to work out. We're not going to use all the cameras at the same time. These are guns on a rack. We can grab them. But the, the, uh, the device has a monitor. It has a follow focus system. It has a Teradac. You can just grab it. Okay, I'm ready to shoot, right? So it's like that mentality is kind of where I like to be in the space. And, it, and it's fair to say, J Jared was really loving your live stream, but that was before you started talking about red. So he's, he's probably really loving it now. <laughs> so let's, uh, we have time for one more question. Okay. Well, before we do that, uh, you said, <laughs> you said you had a uh, live stream coming up. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. So uh, we have a live stream coming up on the 28th of January on the Filmmakers Academy. And uh, the first five Filmmaker Academy members that sign up get to be a part of the whole process. I'm going to have my gaffer, my key grip, my first AC uh, there so you can be able to ask questions. And we're going to be basically doing LUT creation like I would do on my next feature film. So I'm building LUTs for my next feature film. We're gonna be shooting with the Lights full frame primes as well as the Optima Agenue full frame primes. And we're gonna be doing it on the V Raptor as well as the Raptor XL. So I can use the internal NDs of the XL as well as my Tiffin Naturals on the V Raptor and see what that comparison is. I'm also going to shoot with two different lenses. So one lens set will be the lights, which are a little yellow green, and the Optimas, which the Optimas, which are uh, more uh, magenta in their tonality. So that way, I'm building LUTs for two different lens uh, lenses, and we're going to do them in seven different environments. So we'll have day exteriors backlit, sidelit, and overcast. And then we're gonna come into our studio environment. We're gonna shoot under cool white fluorescence, warm white fluorescence. We're gonna shoot under top light scenarios. We're gonna shoot in practical light scenarios, as well as batten light 
scenarios. So you'll see my bat lights blazing and seeing how I use the color temperature of the camera to come down to turn those super, super warm sources into more of a, a whitish warm tonality. And we'll be building all these LUTs on February 28th. I'm sorry, January 28th. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a live stream. We'll probably take three or three hours in this live stream to go through all the environments. We'll have them all racked and stacked up so we can just move from one environment to the next. And I'll be taking questions along the way in every lighting environment. Uh, we're also going to have Lauren Sims from Red there. So any technical questions that you want to ask about the V Raptor or the Raptor XL, he will be there to ask them, uh, to answer them for you. So this is going to be a deep dive into cinematography and how you create the worlds uh, that you're going to lens. Uh, and it all starts with building that lookup table. That's, that's, that's incredible. Um, I am looking for your final question. There's, there's one that's been asked about six times and I did not want to end on that one, so I'm trying to find something different. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, oh, right. and it's also yeah. going to be free. So this is a free. This is the members, the Filmmakers Academy, the first five members that are Filmmaker Camera, they're able to come. But this is going to be streaming on YouTube as well. So it's, it's going to be simulcast to YouTube as well as the Filmmaker Academy uh, platform. So, and you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, there's every 15 to 20 minutes, there's going to be a Q&A block. Uh, so understand that this is a free event uh, and we're just kind of giving back to the filmmaking community and also showing the Filmmaker Academy members what we're pushing this year. And what we're pushing at the Filmmakers Academy is new mentors and the community aspect that you feel that you're very one with our platform and one with the mentors. So a lot of community involvement this year, a lot of networking involvement, a lot of coaching sessions, all these things are coming your way. And that's on both filmmakersacademy.com and it'll be on YouTube's, uh, on YouTube with the Filmmakers Academy uh, YouTube channel, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, yes. Th there you go. <laughs> um, man, I, all right. Well, let's, let's just do a version of this question. So with, with the drama and the, of, of Terminator Salvation, what, what have you learned from that? And then what would you say about how to balance and, and I guess, interact with all the various, uh, uh, both, both uh, actors and uh, team members and directors, et cetera, et cetera. How do you balance communication on set? Yeah, I mean, that, that, uh, that was a very, uh, you know, after it all happened on that, uh, you know, uh, Christian and I basically hugged each other, drank a whole bottle of sake, and kind of called it a day. Uh, he said that he was totally out of line. He apologized. Uh, you know, I was, I, you know, it was, it was just uh, that's very much in the history of of uh, uh, of what's gone down. But uh, we completely are you know, totally bonded with each other. Uh, even at the rap party, we were uh, hanging out and just having a really good time and thinking about all the crazy shit we did on uh, Terminator Salvation. And, you know, the one thing he did is uh, before I, I left his little, uh, you know, cluster of, of uh, people that he was with, he goes, this movie looks unlike any movie I've ever seen and I'm so proud of what you created. So that was a vindication for me uh, moving forward. He was at a difficult time in his, in his life as well. Uh, you know, uh, Keith Ledger had just died. He was on the whole Batman uh, thing. You know, he was, he, was con he was coming into Terminator Salvation one day and being jet-setted to London for press, then over to Thai, uh, you know, over, over to Asia, over all, he was being just flown everywhere and a whole schedule was ebbing and flowing with this whole press uh, scenario of the Dark Knight. So, 
you know, it was uh, a very trying time for him. And he's like, basically was very honest with me and said, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, but, you know, it's like I, you know, learning from that was, was basically, you know, it was, uh, I find that when you first start out as a cinematographer, you're all about trying to make sure, you know, every dot is, every I is dotted, every T is crossed. And what I really learned from that is as much as you can do to shape and, and manicure the light and make sure the camera and everything and the lenses and all that stuff, but when those actors are ready and the train has left the building, you let the train go. Uh, you know, you do not go in there uh, and try to, uh, you know, once the actors are in their zone, they're in the zone. And uh, I try to take my time to light it as good as I can and understand there's going to be, uh, there's going to be problems that happen on set. I'll never forget uh, a great one was with Shia LaBeouf on Greatest Game Ever Day, uh, Greatest Game Ever Played. Day two, night. It was a beautiful shot. We were behind his, his uh, mother and him. They had just seen this opera and it kind of just, you know, we go into the zone of zooming in and into his mind where, you know, her singing just felt like it was coming from her soul is what he was telling his mom. And that's the way he felt about the game of golf. Well, we're pushing on and we see this uh, carriage go by with the little twinkly gas lights go by and we see their home in the distance with oil lamps in the background. And the camera jammed. And we said, okay, let's take it back again. And we move forward and the camera jammed. And he came forward and the camera jammed for the third time. And Shia LaBeouf went off on everyone. He was like, you know, he's like, what, what is going on, Shane? You know, you know, this is unacceptable. I'm in the zone, blah, blah, blah. And Bill Paxton, you know, said, hey, Shia, uh, do you mind uh, coming with me and going around the back here? And he goes, you're an actor. It's your job to react to whatever situations happen. And we are going to figure out this technical problem right now but you have to react to it. Just like when you move and you don't wanna go with the blocking and everything where Shane has lit you and you change that, well Shane is liquid. He's adjusting to everything just to be able to make the emotion of your performance come out and be its best. We're having a technical issue right now. You need to go back and you need to apologize to this whole crew and you need to just stand on your mark and say, Shane, can I have another? And sure enough, what was happening is on the, 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 uh, to the mag, the, the, the flange, the little brush, the gold Feed plates lips. that were there, yeah. you know, those little sensors had come uh, blackened, so they weren't getting uh, the full electrical charge, so the mag was not talking to the camera. And once we cleaned that, we were off to the races. But sure enough, he came right back and he said, Shane, I'm so sorry. He apologized to the whole crew. And he goes, you tell me where to go. You tell me what to do. I am with you. And ever since that, we were like, it was gold. And, you know, he, he started, and he was a young actor at the time. So these are the kind of things that you kind of learn as an actor and as a cinematographer, that shit is gonna fail. And actors are going to move and not do exactly what you had planned. And you as an artist need to think on your feet and use common sense and be able to work with that, as well as actors need to understand that sometimes shit goes wrong and we're just gonna have to deal with it. We had the same thing happen on fathers and daughters. We all of a sudden had a cold snap and all the Preston follow focus, all our follow focus systems seized up. So we couldn't even use them in Pittsburgh. 
It was like the most bitter cold you could imagine. And we just had to roll with it. And, you know, Aaron Paul and Amanda Seyfried were so gracious. And they were like, Shane, if you got to put the heaters on it, just we'll go up to the truck. You know, we'll warm up. And when you feel you're ready, we'll come down and deliver it. And this is the beautiful ebb and flow of how cinematographers work directly with actors and kind of, you know, you got to appreciate what they do and they in tune appreciate what we're able to do and i can tell you is i'm on camera a lot more uh and with my filmmakers academy and what actors do is unbelievable how they get into that zone the emotional space to be able to cry and deliver those emotions and remember all those lines when we're trying to move cameras around them and intense technical you know shots of of uh, you know cranes and all this stuff and they just ebb and flow with it af absolutely effortlessly i'm telling you i it's it is an amazing talent and actors should uh, i'm kissing the ground that they walk on because you know, we're only dealing with a small uh, world of, of our technical expertise, and they are a having to deal with everyone from department heads, a touch a little bit of them in every way. So if there's anything that I can give advice on this, it's basically each entity appreciating what each other does and understanding that, uh, you know, it's a family environment and we need to, you know, come together and really thrive as this family unit so we can deliver the best product possible. I think that's probably the, the most balanced and passionate, if not intelligent response to that kind of a question. I, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of great little stories in there that you tell, but they all come to the same point. And I think to kind of, like you were alluding to, round it all the way back, it's the same thing with the balance of your family, where you all have to learn to communicate in the best way possible in the situation that you're in, and that's how you succeed. And that's, and that's the most difficult job that I have as a cinematographer, is to communicate the vision to every department. And as I've uh, gained experience and I've done more movies, I've tried to change that process and alter it and create so it's this kind of beautiful ecosystem where we're using documents that we share, almost like Google Drive, where every document is a living, breathing beast that everyone can contribute to. So it's not just the script that tells you how to make the movie, but it's this shot listing, blocking schematic, uh, you know, uh, details of what the art department should bring, what the hair and makeup team should bring, what the production design should add. All these things, uh, you know, are generated in one living, breathing document other than the script that can then educate everyone. Well, that. Uh, oh, come I mean, on, that... Pappert. I'm done, man. I'm done. There's no more 4.5 hours. <laughs> I think uh, I think it is a a absolutely wonderful place to to, to pull the end of, pull the cord on this one. Uh, I think I speak for everyone, Shane, when I say thank you so much for your time and your passion, your energy, your knowledge, your heart, your soul, your family for allowing you the balance to to do all of this and to share and give back and. Uh, and everyone should go check out Filmmakers Academy to continue that journey with Shane and his family and, and everybody else that, that he's built around him. Uh, it's it's a, great, a great place to get more of this. And, uh, and uh, I want to also do a shout out to David Weldon that put up and set up all this live stream so you could be looking at it guy. from a red camera to me and the background lit beautifully. And Kurt... Uh, Walrath, that is my prep tech that has put together all the cameras and everything that is serviced. Lydia, Kira, that's done all the social media and marketing to help uh, Scott on this uh, podcast uh, get more of an audience. 
uh, you know, all to my ghostwriter, Zach, and my amazing creative producer, Brendan Sweeney, that makes everything feel like it's effortless. And I have to say, that's the biggest compliment I can give this person, because when somebody told me on a movie that watching you make movies is effortless, that could, that's the greatest compliment anyone can give. And Cristobal, my team marketing, Anne, who's our business operations manager, uh, the, the Alix, who's in customer service, who she gives you the white glove treatment on every single question that's ever asked within the Filmmakers Academy. We have a, an amazing small but mighty team uh, that basically is centered around fueling the passion and inspiration to the next generation. So think about me tossing gasoline on your creativity and inspiration as an artist. That's what the Filmmakers Academy is all about. And that is so true. Do you have any last words you want to say? No, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank um, you, Scott, for oh. putting this all together and uh, arranging for this. And you're such a gentleman. And My uh, pleasure. I, I really uh, loved your experience. I. I was gonna go crack a beer when you cracked your uh, cigar, but I uh, <laughs> I was uh, I was we too into the eight. passion of the point. <laughs> Thank you so much for the kind words. I'm gonna drop you down. I'm gonna close out, and then I'll come right back to you. All right, awesome. If, if you Take don't, care, if everyone. you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see here. Um, as soon as I figure out how to do it, here we go. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining. Remember. Uh, filmmakersacademy.com. Uh, they also have a YouTube channel where they have a, a lot of their, their information that they share out there. So you can, you can get some of it. You can, you can interact with them. There's all kinds of, of support groups inside of Filmmakers Academy. It's a great resource. You should definitely check it out. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and participating and uh, feel free to share this stream out to the world. Let everybody know, cause this was, this was a wealth of knowledge and as always, as I like to leave it, don't let your passions center around your life. Let your life center around your passions.